Johnson is absent. Melton, Palermo, Rowe, Bagley, Harding, Mr. President. Uh, everybody said, um, you know what, I'm just going to take a brief moment um, to wish everybody, I hope you're enjoying a, a great summer. If you haven't been down to the new Riverfront uh, Park, take your family down. It's a great place. Um, we just had it open. I know the mayor is here. Thank you, Mayor, for, you know, another <laughs> wonderful spot that's really transforming our downtown. And what's great about it is you can take your kids down there Take your family down there. You don't have to spend any money. Of course, we'd like for you to. That's always good to invest in the city. Um, but it's a great place that you can go and visit and hang out. So I hope everybody is able to take some time off their busy schedules and work to go do something and enjoy something with their loved ones and their family. And I'm glad we have just one more place in Omaha that we can offer. So have a great rest of your summer. An affidavit of publication is on file for the pre-council and city council meeting, and a current copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in a white binder on the east wall of legislative chambers. Good afternoon and welcome to the Omaha City Council. We appreciate having you here today. We look forward to your testimony on our many items we have for public hearing today. We appreciate if you turn your cell phones off or at least to vibrate. A couple of notes up front here um, to the agenda is we intend to move number 93 up to the very front of our agenda because we have the mayor here who intends to address that issue. And then number 75 has been stricken from the agenda. So we'll start there without objection. We'll uh, have the clerk call up number 93. Item 93, an ordinance to approve an agreement with the Community Information Trust to design and construct a new central library at 72nd and Dodge Streets wherein the city will contribute $20 million on or before January 1, 2025 is communication and opposition. Thank you. The public hearing on number 93 is today. Just a few notes on this item and also three or four other items along the, the way here that are substantive and lengthy in nature is we intend to have the applicant come up to give an overview of those topics so that everyone has a base understanding of what's being proposed and then we'll take proponents and opponents. And this is the first one of that nature which is the proposed new central library. So I would first call up the mayor to give her remarks um, and then we'll have um, Rachel Jacobson uh, present uh, to the council. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Jean Stothard, 1819 Farnham. I'm the mayor of Omaha. Our Omaha public libraries are tremendous community assets, welcoming public spaces that open new doors for young readers and lifelong learners, creative thinkers and makers. Libraries offer connections and access to ideas, technology, and a safe physical space. We have a remarkable opportunity to expand our library system in Omaha, to build and operate one of the most innovative public libraries in the country, and to increase and improve traditional library services and expand emerging technology. This is possible because we have strong and generous philanthropic support for civic projects that enhance the quality of life in Omaha for everyone. The agreement before you <clears throat> with Community Information Trust is our commitment to proceed with the Central Library and a plan for future library operations. I believe we all agree the Central Library will be another uniquely Omaha attraction and community resource. This agreement includes our $20 million contribution to the project. After all, it will be an Omaha public library owned operated and managed by the city and city employees. The funding is allocated in our capital improvement plan in 2024 and 2025 prior to the expected opening in 2026. We will continue annual appropriations to the library system in our general fund budget. When I deliver a recommended 2023 budget to you next week, you will see an increase in the OPL budget, including more staff, higher wages, and new materials for collections. Library Director Laura Marlane and her team, with support from the Board of Trustees, is developing an updated service model, a plan for future library operations, staffing, and training for the entire library system, including the new Central Public Library. 
we have a record of successful public-private partnerships with proven benefits. Open just 19 days, as Councilman Mel or Melton just said, the Jean Leahy Mall has exceeded all of our expectations. It is a place for everyone that will have long-lasting benefits for Omaha now and in the future. Similarly, the Central Library will benefit our city in many different ways. Adding a learning destination to a commercial, residential, and entertainment revival underway at 72nd and Dodge will create an even greater potential for the true crossroads of our city. We can expand the technology offered at Do Space and update our master plan for the entire library system to identify resources and services that will be available in the future. Heritage Omaha and Community Information Trust enlisted a design team to create plans based on preferences of our community, identified through extensive input from the public surveys, open house meetings, interviews with patrons, community leaders and organizations, the library staff, and of course, all of you. Thank you to Heritage, Heritage Omaha uh, President Rachel Jacobson, Library D Director Laura Marlane, the Board of Trustees, and all of our project partners. We have reached this imperative step because of your vision and your commitment. When private and philanthropic interests work with local government and citizens, the impact and the outcomes are far greater than we could ever do on our own. City Council members, your support of this agreement will keep the Central Library Project moving forward. I ask you to vote and approve this agreement next week so that we can proceed on schedule with another one-of-the-kind community asset for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll now hear from the applicant, Rachel Jacobson, representing Community Information Trust. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Jacobson. I'm the president of Heritage Omaha, um, 10050 Regency Parkway. We are a nonprofit organization that builds community assets with the goal of making Omaha and the region a more dynamic and vibrant place to live. Heritage identifies substantial needs or opportunities with high community impact and supports the realization of viable and sustainable projects, civic projects. Public libraries are about safe spaces for everyone and equitable access to information. Libraries all over the world have had to adapt to rapid change in an information landscape that continues to transform the way we live. In response to these evolving needs, in 2015, Heritage created Do Space, a community technology library and digital workshop operated by Community Information Trust, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Do Space was designed to bridge the digital divide and has since served tens of thousands of Omahans offering free high-speed broadband computer access, technology classes for from littles to seniors, and innovative services for entrepreneurs. Early this year, Heritage, along with the Omaha Public Library, Omaha Public Library Foundation, the City of Omaha, and Do Space announced a schematic design and public engagement phase to explore the possibility of a new central public library branch on the Do Space site at 72nd and Dodge that would further OPL's mission of strengthening our communities by connecting people with ideas, information, and innovative services. The new central library would integrate Do Space programming, centralize and modernize collections distribution, and provide much needed public space for partnerships and community connection. Y yes, books, yes, physical collections, but also programs that address the digital divide and safe, adaptable, and inclusive spaces for all community members. If this project moves forward, Heritage will launch a fundraising campaign that, including the city's commitment today, will fund the entirety of capital costs for the new Central Public Library. Meanwhile, the nonprofit Community Information Trust intends to donate the due space property at 72nd and Dodge and the newly constructed library to the city of Omaha for OPL to operate upon completion. If all goes well, we will continue to work on the building design through next spring and could break ground in late summer 2023 
with an estimated opening date as early as the second half of 2025. In addition to construction costs, the capital campaign would also provide for a significant operating reserve at the Omaha Public Library Foundation to support innovative technology programming, staff and staff training, software and equipment upgrades for the first 10 years of the new facility's operations. This would be in addition to the city, Douglas County, and the Omaha Public Library Foundation's ongoing commitment to OPL's annual operating budget which this agreement states would need to be maintained or increased. The campaign will also fund a nationally recognized library consultant to work with OPL to develop an updated facilities master plan with broad community engagement and for the library to develop a new service model that would maximize the benefits of centralized distribution and the integration of due space programming. Um, I'm excited to introduce you to Tom Trenalone of HDR, who along with Ali Pointer Maketo and Margaret Sullivan Studio has developed an incredible vision for a new central public library. As the mayor mentioned, the design was developed in partnership with Omaha Public Library Board and staff, Juice Space staff, um, the Omaha Public Library Foundation Board and staff, of course the mayor's office and city council representatives. Thank you for participating. Um, more than 2,000 community members participated in public surveys and public meetings, and more than 100 community and educational organizations voiced their needs to better serve their constituents. And the design team, along with OPL and DuSpace staff, visited three of the world's most innovative libraries. Thank you to all who participated in the process. I'm so grateful. Um, this vision for a new central public library is the result of many voices and response to diverse community needs now and in the future. It has truly been an honor to work with you all to envision a bright future for Omaha fueled by the library system that celebrates and honors OPL's dedication to literacy and access and serves our city's evolving needs for the next century. Um, happy to introduce Tom Trenalone who will show us some of the design renderings. So. Afternoon, everybody. And Tom, just your name and address for the record, too. Yeah. 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 Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Tom Trenolo, and I am uh, 17116 Burdett Street. Uh, I am a design uh, design director and vice president with HDR. And as Rachel mentioned, I represent a consortium of designers that included Ali Pointer Maketo and Margaret Sullivan Studio. Uh, today, we're going to just give you a really brief. Um, understanding of what's going on with the concepts that we're proposing for 72nd and Dodge. The one thing that we wanted you to understand was the idea that there are four primary pillars that were set up in the conceptual stages and then continued in the schematic stages. And those are the fact, like Rachel mentioned, a number, we want the library to be a world-class library, one that defines Omaha. We wanted to speak of specific design, that design that is landmark in what is its nature, but also one that is open and, and welcoming to the public. The idea that is sustainable, not only for the environment, but the idea that we continue the, continue the long-standing heritage and, and service that the Omaha Public Library has provided to our city. And then ultimately the fact that this is an asset for our community and that, that this community asset should be open and uh, accessible for all. We also lived by the moniker during the design process of finding your place. The idea that the Omaha Public Library is where a number of people, myself included, went as a young child to learn about things, how things went together, and ultimately led to a career in architecture. We believe that the, that mission will continue with the new design. We also talk about the idea that, as you just mentioned, with the new uh, Gene Leahy Mall, that is part of downtown, and downtowns are the heart of our city, but something like 72nd and Dodge represents our soul. If you remember in 2011, there was an insert to the Omaha World Herald that was about Omaha Dye Design and how they were helping us craft a new city. The rendering that they had on that insert was what the future of 72nd and Dodge could look like. We believe that this is a transformative element that will introduce that transformation at 72nd and Dodge. If you think about the generations, my father remembered it as a place where the tornado touched down. As a kid in the 80s, we sat around on cars the idea that borders eventually came there, and then the wonderful transformation that today is now due space. But the one thing that we do know about 72nd is Dodge is when you want to get a point across 
or you want to celebrate something, for some reason or another, this site has a strange hold on our community and we tend to show up there. The site itself is located on the south side of Dodge and on the west side of 72nd Street. It'll hold down that corner and, and it ties into the intersection where Douglas comes together at the rear. The site itself is one of those that, why it was selected, it is one of the most accessible sites via transportation in our city, regardless of how you get there, car, bike, walk, or bus. The idea that it will be in the site of a new, the new Orbitz line that is going on Dodge and then in the future on 72nd Street makes it one of the most multimodal sites that's located in the city of Omaha. The other thing that is interesting and nice that we were able to take advantage of on the site is it has access on what we consider the grade level of Dodge Street, which offers a, an entry point right in, right out to the north of the site and allows for the ability for um, school, school trips or let's say uh, residential visits to be dropped off there at the west entrance. But it also takes advantage of the fact that it actually allows us, excuse me, to introduce a lower level where we can allow for traffic to come close to the building to allow for book, pickup and drop off and also service without compromising, without compromising the uh, component of the the component of the first level pedestrian access. The building itself, we want it to look as if it is part of a, a collective whole, but the idea that it represents each of the um, individual components of Omaha, Nebraska and our citizenry. And we also want the, it to open up that idea of a book where you have that point of entry. And we have done that so that it, open, it is open and it is welcoming to the community as opposed to a, a building that it looks standoffish. This is a rendering at 72nd and Dodge. You can see that the crossroads sign is off to, your, off to your right, but the idea that it lifts up like that book and then those individual modules of glass represent the bricks that come together and complete us as a city as a whole. It is also, it looks as the fact on the north side, we want a dynamic facade that represents the energy and just business of, of 72nd and Dodge Street, but also the ability to lift up on both sides, offering a sense of openness to both east and west. Allowing for the opportunity for as people approach it to, to lift itself up and allow people to usher in. But then, like I said, the nice thing about the way the site presents itself, it allows us the ability to use the two levels of the site, one to allow for service and automobile traffic to circulate near the building and then allow for an upper level that has options for Civic Plaza and gardens that are directly related to the first floor of the, of the library. This is a rendering actually of what, what relates is the fact that that busy, ex, the busy exterior on the north helps engulf a, or, or protect a green space that becomes the new city garden that becomes the heart of the, heart of the library itself as you transform into the inside. Thank you very much. I was just you, about to do that, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> as you transform yourself or transition into the interior of the building, the cultural commons, the cafe, the meeting spaces, all look out onto that green space. It becomes the heart of the entire building. And the other one that, like Rachel mentioned, is that it becomes one of a place of not simply books, but the idea of cultural engagement and people coming together socially. The building itself is, is organized into three main floor or four main floors with a mezzanine. Uh, it offers the opportunity of coming into the front of the building as a moment of, of real energy and excitement. And as you continue to go up, the building quiets itself. On the second floor, the children's, the children's spaces and their ability for story time will be represented along with new and expanded capabilities of do space that will maintain its home here at 72nd and Dodge. And ultimately, what is unique, and the mayor mentioned this, the first of its kind is the intention that we will introduce an a automatic retrieval system, the ASRS, which will be the heart of this, the heart of the building. As Rachel mentioned, we took trips across the United States and, and across the world to see the best libraries. And this is one where we believe this sets up the future of the library. Not only is it about in a single building, but this system helps engage the entire uh, network of, Omaha, of the Omaha Public Library, allowing for future flexibility and expansive um, collections. 
those opportunities allow us to put more books into the system, but then offer opportunities for the library to actually introduce new and exciting displays, but also programmatic services. This is one where this would make this the first building, the first public library in the United States to incorporate this system and making us truly unique. But most importantly, the intention of the design is to actually create a space that is a home and the living room for our community of Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to leave you with this point. Sorry, everybody. First time in public again after the pandemic. <laughs> We're doing fine. Um, there's a documentation in Omaha that we've provided to the city council, but also those of you that are online can go to omahacentrallibrary.org and all the documentation over the process that was done during schematics. And this includes the city engagement, the program meetings, all of the extensive data that was collected prior to the design is available online. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. And now I know we have the library director by Zoom. I think we'll give Ms. Marlene a chance to also speak as a proponent, if we can back out of the screen there. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Marlene. I'm the executive director of Omaha Public Library. And I'm here to speak as a proponent to the proposed ordinance. Um, I really want to start by saying that I'm grateful for the commitment from the city of Omaha and assurance from Omaha's philanthropic leaders in this investment in the future of our community's library system. Throughout its 150 years history, Omaha and Douglas County residents have been proud and vocal supporters of the library. We hear their needs and the needs are great. It's our desire to not only meet those needs, but to exceed their expectations. Currently, OPL provides library services with tax dollars from the city and county residents. Gen generous private gifts provided to OPL through the Omaha Public Library Foundation and the Friends of OPL help the library to go above and beyond and provide extras such as digital collections, um, summer reading program, Omaha Reads, and much more. Looking ahead, we know that the library must continue to evolve to help meet the changing dynamic needs of the people that we serve. Independently and with our partners, we've done the work in our community to learn the ways that our libraries are used and how they'll be used in the future. OPL views this ordinance as a way to ensure that it will have the resources it needs to anticipate and prepare for what's next. OPL is committed to collaborating with the city, the foundation, the Community Information Trust, Heritage Omaha, and Do Space to update the library's facilities plan, build a state-of-the-art library at 72nd and Dodge, and develop a world-class library system that will be enjoyed today and well into the future. For these reasons, I'm in support of this ordinance, and I ask that you vote favorably to help ensure that OPL remains a valuable resource in Omaha for generations to come. Thank you, and available for questions later, right? Yes. Thank you. Any other proponents today that want to testify on number 93? Hi, my name is Rebecca Stavick, 7205 Dodge Street. I'm the CEO of Community Information Trust, and I was the founding executive director of Do Space when it first launched in 2015. I'm also a librarian, and I'm a member of the executive board of the Urban Libraries Council. I'm here today to advocate for the future of libraries in our city and to express support for the Central Library Project. The mission of DoSpace is to empower our community with technology, and we do that through access to tech as well as tech education for everyone. We offer access to ultra-fast Wi-Fi internet, high-end high computers and 3D printers, as well as access to dozens of technology classes every month, all of which is free to the community thanks to our generous donors. DoSpace has a little something for everyone, but we aim to make a significant impact on those um, who need us the most. Um, that would include folks who are impacted by digital inequities in the community, as well as yeah. Omaha's entrepreneurs, inventors, and creators. Do Space is more than just a building, it's a movement. Our work here in Omaha has inspired makerspaces and technology projects all around the world. 
I'm proud to say that our robust approach to bridging the digital divide has helped to set a new standard on technology access in public libraries. Tech access and digital library, digital literacy work are critical components of building equity in our community. I believe the future of library services will not only continue to have a focus on technology, but must also offer our community a variety of information resources, which includes print books, audio, video, and a, a number of other materials, all of which are vital to creating a high quality of life for our community. This blended approach is precisely what we propose with the Central Library Project, a robust, robust community space offering a blend of the highly popular and impactful library services of the Omaha Public Library partnered with the high tech of DoSpace services and programming. As you are well aware, we live in extraordinary times, and I believe the years ahead will challenge our country in ways that we may not be able to fully predict. What we need are resilient communities whose members have the tools to gather and collaborate on the issues that matter to them the most. And it's public libraries that are the place where that community engagement happens. We need strong and resilient libraries, which will support strong and resilient communities. In conclusion, I'm here today to express my support for the Central Library Project. Community Information Trust is dedicated to our partnership with the Omaha Public Library, the City of Omaha, Heritage Omaha and the Omaha Public Library Foundation to bring this project to fruition to benefit the Omaha community. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Good afternoon. My name is Angela McGraw, and I am the director of Do Space, um, located at 7205 Dodge, and I am here in support of the Central Library Project. As Do Space moves forward with our digital equity efforts, we are working to understand the future facing tech needs of the general public that is navigating the impact of COVID-19. In the same way modern libraries do, Do Space offers technology that residents can check out and use in their homes, along with constantly evolving technology available in our physical space. Most recently, thanks to federal funding, DoSpace has given out more than 750 computers to Omaha residents through partnerships with nonprofit organizations. And ultimately, we will distribute close to 950 laptops along with internet access all for free. DoSpace continues to offer programming and events for folks of all ages, including regular tech mentoring, technology assistance for seniors, educational programs for children, and programs that teach adults, adults how to pursue a career in the technology industry. DoSpace is an active partner in the planning and development of the future Omaha Central Library. DoSpace style technology will be integrated into the system so that together OPL and DoSpace can continue to anticipate and meet the needs of our community. DoSpace membership has grown to 88,000 plus and that number continues to actively grow. In partnership with OPL, DoSpace will continue growing and also make progress towards our goals of serving the community members who need access to technology the most. Thank you. Thank you. Other proponents? Good afternoon. My name is Silva Raker, and I'm the inaugural CEO for the Kiwit Luminarium, currently under construction on the riverfront. Do you need my temporary office address or my home address? Uh, home, probably. Home is 5106 Izzard here in Omaha. Thanks. So good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the library project. Um, I am a relative newcomer to Omaha, having moved here only 10 months ago. And my own story, um, I like to joke that I was raised by a library. Um, I grew up in a, a kind of a poor rural family and we did not have a lot of books. And so early on, you know, I had a library card at age four and spent a lot of time in these public spaces, so it's hard for me to overstate the importance in my own life of libraries and, and also the recognition that I have for what it can mean to others and be a resource for the whole community. That's a, a key part of what we're trying to do with Keywood Luminarium. It's, um, we talk about diverse workforce development, but it really begins with notions of identity, um, notions of belonging, and access to education, 
um, and even kind of learner-centric um, experiences that allow you to, to think that you can understand the world and therefore participate in it as a citizen, as a, as a person who can explore a variety of options. So the library is uh, at the heart of that, I believe. Um, and, and there's research that shows that museums and libraries are among the most trusted institutions in the country. So the, having being new to Omaha and being a beneficiary of the investment um, that the city makes. Um, heritage, this is the Luminarium is also a heritage project. I was I started working on the project in 2019 as a consultant for the Exploratorium. My head was turned by the city and the incredible investment, ongoing investment in public institutions. For me, the um, Luminarium is in a flow of that, and this library project would be a stunning, um, a stunning even larger, more would impact even more people and be recognizable on a global scale. Um, so it's, to me, it makes sense in terms of the momentum that is already building here. The mayor referenced Jean Lay Mall and the Riverfront Project, but I see so many signs of that from the urban core to the, the, the kind of um, substrate of, of really vibrant and vital nonprofit organizations throughout the community, and very importantly, the partnerships between public and private to make things happen. So again, this, this project feels to me like um, a very natural and also um, spectacular next step in the city's development. I, another reason I came here from San Francisco is that I, I think Omaha has the potential of this region to be a very influential model for the rest of the country and even the world. So I love hearing about this being the first place in the country where perhaps the automated retrieval system might be deployed. I think these kinds of models and these messages coming from Omaha are, some, are perhaps more influential and relevant for a lot of folks than things coming from the coast. So the fact that Omaha is and can cont continue to be a leader in this innovation and progressive way um, is something that I think is also very exciting. So that's it for me. I, I want to thank you all for your leadership and your helping to create this fantastic city that I'm privileged to be a part of and, and uh, just voice my support for the project. Thank you, and welcome to Omaha. We look forward to seeing your building open too. Thanks. <laughs> Other proponents? Donnie Johnson. The Johnson Equestrian Foundation, North Omaha Concerned Citizen Foundation, 4928 North 52nd Street. Uh, this is what we've been working on for a long time. I'm glad to see the city council is going to vote yay for this because the library today is obsolete. And as we move forward to an international law school, as we debate this issue, who should have the law, international law school, Creighton, UNO, or Lincoln, I think. As you look at the library to remodel it, it costs a fortune to rewire it. As I went into France and Egypt and I looked into this process of why are Senator Carnes them sending me into this program through the United Nations? So reality, I'm so glad Nebraska has finally reached this point where they can do this and the pioneers of this city and this state would be really happy that you voted yay for this because this is what we did back in the 60s and the 70s. We finally, I presume, have enough money to do this. That was one of the holdups. As, at Macmillan uh, Junior High, we worked on the NASA space program that other kids did not have a chance to participate in. So now, as we get a chance to move forward, we don't have a Library of Congress. But one thing I can say is this. Senator Dave Karn, Senator Zarensky, and as they start building this building, I was a part of that the debate. And now we've come to another debate, should we move forward? And to bring the, uh, my grandkids and your grandkids and the kids of this city up to date, this would be a major step to bringing them into the future of what we look at as a, the technology world of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Other proponents today? Luis Jimenez, 2709 Dewey Avenue. Uh, I like this, um, um, this project. I go to Do Space. I've been going since 2016. Uh, I use their technology when I'm doing research, um, and uh, it's amazing. It's uh, a, a like when you sit in front of a computer. Like I've been there a f um, like last week, and you can't find the tower for the computer. It's just you got your space and you got a monitor. Uh, a, a nice working station. And so even sometimes, if I don't need to go to do space, but I still need to use technology, I'll go to do space. 
just so I can have uh, that experience. Um, and I also go to the library. I'll go to the, li the Sorensen branch library, and then I'll go to do space. So putting those two uh, together, I think that's a great idea. Although I wouldn't want to navigate through, through ma too many bookshelves, um, but I saw the design for do space and it looks like it's gonna um, remain uh, like do space. So um, I appreciate that and I'm excited for this, even though it's gonna take a few years, but it's gonna be a good uh, place to go to, to do my research anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Other proponents today? Good afternoon. My name is Wendy Townley and I serve as executive director of the Omaha Public Library Foundation. For a few more weeks, my address is 215 South 15th Street. On behalf of the Omaha Public Library Foundation, we are inspired by the potential of the new Central Library and request the Omaha City Council's approval of this historic project. We are grateful for the decades of philanthropic support our beloved Omaha Public Library has received through the Library Foundation. These include monthly $10 gifts from individuals and families, six-figure multi-year pledges from private foundations, ticket purchases and sponsorships of our annual fundraiser, and everything in between. We wish to thank Heritage Omaha and Community Information Trust for their partnership, and we are eager to continue this important, patron-focused, community-led work together for Omaha Public Library. Thank you. Thank you. Other proponents today? Can I see a show of hands of how many more proponents are speaking, just to give us a sense? All right, maybe one or two more. Go ahead. All right, good afternoon. Katie Bruno, 1317 South 36th Street and I am the president of the board of directors of the Omaha Public Library Foundation. Since 1985, the Omaha Public Library Foundation has existed to partner with local donors to support, grow, and reimagine the Omaha Public Library. This began with our first fundraising project, raising a million dollars to digitize the OPL card catalog. That work has continued year after year since. The community has put its trust in the Omaha Public Library Foundation for three decades, and for good reason. We are eager for our role in the historic project at 72nd and Dodge. Today, on behalf of the foundation, we ask for the city council's approval to make the Central Library a reality. At the Omaha Public Library Foundation, we see a tremendous value and opportunity for Omaha Public Library through a partnership with Community Information Trust. The work we will accomplish together will serve library patrons and our whole community in the coming years and well into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next proponent. Sonette Taylor, 3801 Heidi. I'll make it quick. Um, I'm a proponent because I believe that this library is what the city needs. You're bringing technology and access to knowledge um, to the entire community. Um, the programming that's there will be for the entire community. I lived in a city in Kansas. I won't say the name of the city, but the only thing I liked about that city was the library. They had public speakers come in from all over the nation. They had events for communities to come, everybody in the community to come together. And so I think it's important um, that we support this new library as we grow as a city. You need the technology, you need advancements, you need buildings that are public spaces that draw people to Omaha. So I am a proponent for this. Uh, and I am a lover of books and technology in general. So I just think that this will be great for our city and also great for all the people here. Thanks. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? <clears throat> Larry Stover, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha 68132. I'm not against a library. I just happen to be against this one. And once again, I think a lot of it is due to lack of transparency. Words matter, language matters, presentations matter, and tax dollars matter. 
A good salesman asks for the order a number of times, and if necessary, he drops the pin in your lap. He doesn't leave till he gets the order. This council works a little bit the same way. We get one hearing today. No matter what happens today, you might come back next week with amendments. We don't get to say anything during amendments. And there is no debate. We don't debate here. We just listen. There's no two-way, but I know from your rules you can ask questions if you choose to. Not all nonprofits are wonderful, and not all nonprofits are charitable without expecting something in return. Not all community partners, uh, library board members, whatever, contribute dollars and money without expecting some kind of influence, some kind of power, maybe even tax dollars. Nonprofits pay a salary to somebody. Nonprofits come down here and ask for money. Nonprofits get some money. How often do we really ask the hard questions, though? Now, the average citizen doesn't have the time to spend to read all your documents, let alone look up the definitions of the words. But common sense reading some of these things would lead them to say, oh, well, if the city's contributed $20 million, where's the rest of the money coming from? A foundation, the foundation isn't contributing any money. It doesn't say that they are. The Omaha Public Library Foundation isn't contributing any money. It doesn't say that they are. Are they the builder also? Is this a local builder, out-of-state builder? Did they get TIF financing? Uh, we find out, however, if you've paid attention, that there is a large company in Omaha that's sort of behind this. And they won't do one thing without us doing another, which means you have to move the library. But I remember going down here with a brand new camera years ago, taking sequential pictures of all those beautiful big buildings that we blew up and demolished at taxpayer expense for Canagra. Yes, they have a minimal presence, but people do tend to leave town and then the taxpayers are left holding it. So tread carefully before you vote six to nothing, seven to nothing. Ask some questions, debate it amongst yourselves so the taxpayers can hear some of you that may have doubts about it. Thank you. Thank you. Other opponents today? Hi, um, I'm Marjorie Sturgeon, 1015 North 16th Street. Uh, I'm also a member of the SeaTac board. Um, I want to start by saying I am an opponent of this proposal in its current form. Um, and I urge the city council to amend the proposal with the following, that the city will work with the Cable Television Access Corporation and Community Information Trust to include dedicated operating space comprising of a broadcast studio, set storage, and audiovisual editing suites for production of public, educational, and governmental access channels, uh, also known as PEG programming by KPAO, Omaha's public access channel, on Cox 22, 1022 HD, and streaming at kpaotvomaha.org. Um, I'm a volunteer member of the CTAC board that oversees KPAO, Omaha's public access channel, which has its next meeting on August 8th. Um, in the lead up to this proposal for a new central library coming before the city council today, I've seen the debate unfold around the core concepts of information access, government transparency, and opportunities to reduce the digital divide, everything everyone's already talked about um, in our community. And I can't help but point out that KPAO is all of those things. Um, and not including KPAO in the new facility is a huge missed opportunity. In the, Central, in the Omaha Central Library Project's own community engagement findings, which are posted on their website, they ask stakeholders what spaces and places would support your organization at the library. 44% of those who answered answered a podcast room. 
37% answered a film studio. These answers underpin the value of public access television. Both of those audiovisual mediums can be done right now at KPAO. I would like us to ensure KPAO has a long future serving the Omaha community by bringing it into the fold of these library facility discussions. To be frank, I'm concerned that as cable subscriptions decrease and franchise agreements change, there's a risk public access television could disappear. But imagine a library patron heading over to this new building, which is beautiful, where you can pick up your books, use the computers, 3D print something, and then in the same spot, meet with our awesome studio manager, Mike Wallace, to develop and produce a new program on a topic that interests you. The, there are libraries around the country with audiovisual facilities and even collaborations with public access television. I can provide a list that I've also shared with the SeaTac board and the Omaha Public Library board. If you're like me and you see the potential of how these two organizations, KPAO and the Omaha Public Library, can join forces and better serve our community, please amend this proposal. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Other opponents today? Seeing none, public hearings closed. I don't see any lights, but I do have a few questions myself I might ask, and then we'll see if others might have lights on as well. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for their testimony today and providing that overview. I think that was helpful to our understanding and certainly an impressive building that's being proposed here and discussed here in partnership with philanthropy. Ms. Jacobson, I think I might have a couple questions for you first. It may also be for for, Ms., uh, for, for Rebecca as well, but we'll see um, which one you prefers to handle um, the answers here. So this agreement is between the city and what's called Community Information Trust. I'm not sure um, there's widespread knowledge about Community Information Trust or who they are. Can you just describe who it is and who the board members are and that sort of thing? Right. So um, Heritage created Community Information Trust. It's a related organization. It's also a nonprofit organization. It's called a related organization because all the board members are Heritage board members. So, um, but it was developed in order to develop do space. And so, um, and so Heritage will be responsible for, um, for executing the project itself and Community Information Trust will, um, you know, will continue to be responsible for do space, but then Rebecca as the CEO of Community Information Trust will also be engaged obviously with the visioning for the project as she's um, sort of the, our technology expert and representative there. So, um, so it's really, it, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't look pretty, but it like kind of keeps things, um, it keeps things clean as far as, um, you know, who, how things are functioning rather than running everything through heritage. You know, it's a separate independent entity and people would give their gifts to community information trust through the campaign. So. And there are board members of Community Information Trust, right? Who are also board members of Heritage, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there a? Do you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah. You can find that on the 990. It's um, uh, Mike McCarthy, um, David Slasberg, um, I, um, Karen Linder, um, and I sit on that board as well as the president of Heritage. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, and then. It, as was discussed a little bit in pre-council today, and, and, and there are a few comments along these lines today here as well. Um, usually when there's a, a complicated redevelopment agreement like this, there is um, some pretty specific provisions in terms of what each party will do, and th there are some of those in here that I wanted to talk about for a minute. But one that, one that came up this morning was um, the amount being raised for this project. Um, this document does conceive of $20 million of being um, contributed by the city in 2024 and 25 um, for what I think has been expressed as a project that's for a total of 135 million or thereabouts. Um, from our conversation this morning, that may, may be going up and, is, and hasn't been totally decided yet. But my question along those lines is, um, to the extent you're willing to, you're comfortable talking about that today sure. uh, and expressing an amount you think you're going to raise, yeah. um, that would be of interest because there's not a total number in the document today. Right, yeah, and we're still figuring that out. We hope to have that final number, you know, within the next few 
few weeks, you know, what our fundraising goal is going to be. Um, it's looking like it's going to be um, at least $140 million in total and potentially um, up to $150 million. And I'll say that that budget includes, you know, in addition to the building itself, it also includes, you know, significant technology investment. We've got this, you know, beautiful garden and landscaping that we're going to design, probably children's play areas within the building, you know, so there's a lot of stuff outside of the, um, you know, construction contract um, that's also included with that. And then, as I mentioned, we also want to fundraise for a uh, reserve for operating that would fund um, a lot of this do space technology um, in the library so that we can make sure that that funding which would be above and beyond you know current library commitments um, is there from the beginning and so the city's 20 million would leverage approximately 120 or 130 million dollars in private funds exactly it'll leverage 120 or 130 and it's all um, to be fundraised, so um, so we would launch the project. We do have commitments from a lot of you know the large foundations, but we haven't. I, I guess we don't have formal commitments. We have um, a lot of the large foundations have said that they're very interested, they're very passionate about this project, and they'll do something. But until we get the approvals and the commitments from all the different entities, we're not going to formally ask for pledges. So all of that. All of that fundraising work is going to happen over the next year, along with the next phases of building design. Um, and our goal would be to fundraise at least 85, hopefully 90 percent of our goal before we break ground next summer. Mm -hmm. And there is a provision in here that talks about July 1st, 2023. Um, is that sort of the goal to have all the funds in hand? Uh, you know, at least 85 or 90 percent, like so that we know that we've got that commitment made, so. Okay. You know. And your organization has a, a really good track record of getting major projects done, but it's, it's that point at which, if it's not, uh, this agreement could be reversed by either party. Yes, okay. yeah, I, 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 think, I think there's something about that. Is, is there, isn't there something in the document about that? Yeah. The, yeah. Mr. Cousy, you wanna talk about that provision? Nakuzi Law Department, there's two provisions in the contract. It's on page three of six, number three, that allow for a termination. The first is there will be a number of things that the council will be asked to look at and adopt, which would be a development agreement, a merger agreement, some resolutions, and things of that nature. If those fail to pass by council, the agreement would, between the city and Heritage, would be void. As to specifically to the financing, the contract does say that by July 1st, 2023, if CIT or Heritage has determined that as unable to raise the funds necessary to fully finance the project, and that then we are therefore notified by them that they're unable to fully finance the project, the um, agreement would be terminated at that point. So there's, there's, two, there's two ways this agreement would be terminated. Um, and those are the two contingencies. Okay, thank you. And I think the last question I have for you is, um, there's also a provision that talks about, should this come to pass and should this be approved, the integration of do space technology library into the current library system. And in our conversations, I think that does involve North and South Omaha's libraries branches, right? Are you prepared to talk about that a little bit, or Rebecca maybe? Or? Well, um, so we're still in conversation with OPL about um, where um, do space might be located during construction, but we want to make sure that we're continuing the services that a lot of Omahans have come to depend on, um, and because we're looking to, um, you know, integrate do space services with OPL, it would only makes sense for do space to operate within branches. So that hasn't yet been finalized, but we are, you know, in conversation with OPL about um, potentially um, having uh, do space sites, do space, I guess we call them satellites or, you know, do space satellites, uh, you know, within at least two of the branches. So okay. during construction and hopefully ongoing if this all goes well. So, yeah. And those would be two, branch, two good branches to do that in, I think. I think so, too. All right. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge Ms. Sturgeon's uh, remarks, too. I know we've talked, and I think you've talked with other council members as well. And I think there is a great possibility here to incorporate public access in the model 
a lot of cities do. Um, and we are in conversation, several council members are, with Cox Communications about that. And we see public access t TV continuing to be very important uh, to our community and, and in that potential agreement and are sort of having a three-way conversation now about how that can proceed and improve the current environs, environment in where you're operating, uh, which could use some improvement, right? But I, w I do want to say, as long as you're here, that you'd be surprised how many people do watch these replays and do watch them live. Um, so it is an important access, uh, access point for the community to, to see what local government is doing. Yeah. I, I saw you get up. Did you want to address yeah, that? Yeah, can I, can I address that? Hi, Marjorie. Um, so I actually, I am a Ra huge- Rachel, just your name again for the- yeah, it's Rachel Jacobson again. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of public broadcasting. I actually worked at WMYC in New York, and um, and I love that idea. Um, I, you know, in conversations with the library and do space, um, I think that there, there is, as you saw in the findings, there is the potential for a podcast studio. There is the potential for video space. And we want to create as flexible uh, um, a space as possible so that we can um, so that, so that there can be the potential for OPL to facilitate partners, partnerships like that. And so um, even though it's not like a solidified partnership at this point, I don't think that that means that it's you know, not possible for the future. Okay. Thank you. And then maybe the last couple of questions I have, and I see there are some lights on. Um, I wanted to engage probably either Ms. Marlene or Mr. Curtis on a couple of provisions about the ongoing operational support paragraphs in here. I think that's a really important part of this discussion. Um, and so this document conceives of should this library be built and should it be then uh, donated to the city of Omaha, that the current library budget um, remains at least above the, what they're calling a baseline in 2022 right now. So I guess my question either to Ms. Marlene or to Mr. Curtis is what, what is that baseline right now that we, we would be building from? on you. Okay. Whoever wants to take that uh, question? Uh, I'll take this. Steve Curtis, City Finance. I, I don't know the exact number. I want to say it's about 18, 19 million, somewhere in that range. And then it is going to grow, even though we don't have the budget finished yet. It'll probably grow by as much as 10% into 23, simply because we'll have other facilities that we're taking care of, the one at 84th and Frederick and the one at 1401 Jones. Okay. So this document reads 2022, so that baseline is probably 18 or 19 million this year in the 2022 budget. Yes. And then it says um, it would need to, over the years, increase in a, in a ratio that's similar to you know, the overall budget growth. And that's typically been three or 4% when we talk about the general fund. Is that generally what your understanding would be in terms of what that growth would need to be? Uh, Generally, the, the city's various departments have grown in the three or four percent probably for quite a while now, at least the last six, seven or eight years. Uh, we've kind of told the library folks that even though we'll let them grow at least at that percent, we'll, we'll all kind of agree as a group that we'll have to do what we need to do to fund that library properly. Because departments can range from 2 percent to 27 percent in any given budget year, right, in terms of growth. Um, so I think it's important to have that understanding. And, and as one who thinks the, uh, the library has been traditionally underfunded, I think it's important to have this conversation so that if we are taking on a substantial new asset, other library branches or the other libraries in our system aren't suffering, there's not supplanting going on. And I know that's definitely the expectation of donors when they make a contribution or a gift like this. Um, Ms. Marlene, did we get her off mute okay? Uh, if you want to address those questions, or I guess the specific question I have for you is, um, you don't have a concern that any other library branch is going to suffer as a result of this agreement going forward financially? No, no, certainly not. Um, any changes that we make in our facilities, ha that has a ripple effect across our whole system, usually in a positive way. This central library project will, will be very similar in um, how we're able to manage collections through the ASRS. And the effect that we'll have across the system was we'll be able to store more back titles that we would love to keep now, but just don't have the space for. Um, by using the ASRS, that'll free up some collection space on the floor so that we have more programming space. 
there'd be more of an ability to have pop-up programs or have more people in the facility at a time for things um, since we're not going to be devoting as much floor space to collections. We will always keep our popular collections. This just gives us a chance to curate things more. And the commitment from the city, the commitment from the mayor to increase our staff in the next year and um, provide funding for us to effectively open the downtown branch uh, it is more than adequate to get us started, and um, we are really looking forward to the work we'll be doing. Thank you. And, and conversely, we don't know exactly what we're committing to in terms of what it will cost to operate the new library, right? But that, that work's underway and what those performers might be? Yes. Yes, that work is currently underway. We have another meeting this week to talk specifically about that. Uh, the last question I have, which is probably the most frequent question I get about this project at this point, which is why 72nd and Dodge? Um, and I, I was going to ask that question of proponents today, but I think Tom, in his opening remarks, uh, addressed that very directly and, and, and pretty eloquently. Um, as one who's lived in other communities where a downtown library is uh, really important and significant, and one who likes the concept of a downtown library, I do think you addressed that question pretty well here today and why why it is um, philanthropy and others have, and the library system have identified this general area as the location, and I know that's been part of the library board's strategic plan, I think, since 2017. But I will say, should this move forward, one thing we all need to be working on is the pedestrian safety at 72nd and Dodge um, for those that are coming to the library, those that are coming to a redeveloped crossroads, um, as Tom said, the heart of our city. All right, thank you. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. A uh, lot of great questions, so I don't have to ask half of them now. Um, as we move forward with this central library project, I will say, unlike other projects, I, I've seen and heard the drawings about the project well in advance that I thought as it continued to move forward. Um, including with the discussion today that we heard from people. Uh, but some of the key words I took out of there were partnership, commitment, engagement, trust, dedication. Ultimately, this is what this agreement will, will bring with us with the commitment from the city of Omaha to this project. But as we move forward with this project, because there's so many moving pieces, we know there's a skyscraper going downtown. We know we can say that this will now be obviously the central library. We've moved a library, but what's most important is we can't forget about the existing libraries we have because they're all gonna work together. Uh, I know this is the WOW project. Uh, and the reason I, I, I bring this up and I say this, Laura, are you still off mute? Yes. Uh, let me ask you about the 14th and Jones branch that I publicly felt and, and know was rushed about the timeline for that being open on time. Is that gonna happen? Um, we don't have a final timeline yet, but we have been looking at interim space um, so that we will not have an interruption in library services downtown. Okay, that's great to hear because this all goes together where these library services are so important to everybody we cannot forget the existing buildings we have or the funding that we have within the city for these buildings as we move forward. Uh, I'm trying to keep on topic with what we have in front of us today, but ultimately what we have in front of us today is because the moving around of libraries we have. So uh, I'm gonna be supporting this, there's no doubt about it, uh, but we can't forget about the libraries we have. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harding, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Tom, if I could have you come up just for a second. Sure. And I, I know this has kind of been covered a little bit too, but I, I, I saw when uh, when Marjorie was up speaking, um, I saw you kind of nodding your head a little bit too, and, and Rachel had, had said some things about the, their space, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to remind people that we're not here today to approve a plan. This is all conceptual. You, you've had, you know, surrettes and, and workshops and input, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity maybe to talk about the conceptual idea of where we are at this point. Yeah, I mean, if you consider the phases of, of a traditional architectural or building process, we're just completed schematics. 
So we've only done concepts and schematics. Design development still needs to be under, it will be undertaken if the project continues to find favor and then we'll go through contract documents and then ultimately there's the building process that'll be another part. The other one that was exciting is that I think that she was very eloquent in pointing out the engagement with the community and, and all of those parts and elements that she was talking about are ones that we are currently engaging in the, the conceptual design to include the type of uh, program that would help in that capacity. So. But also, in addition to that, and I'll kind of pull in some of Rebecca, Rebecca's comments about you know, the, how, how things have changed so dramatically as it relates to technology and, and, and delivery of information over the last few years is that within what you're building, you have to, you have to make sure that you have some flexibility in that to, to make those changes as you know, two years from now when, when a building might be coming online how much might change by then, too? It was a number of the things that we took when we, we visited. So we visited sites in, in Norway and Canada and Calgary and then here in the United States, and all of those were set up with engineering and electrical systems that would allow for the ability for the library to transform over time. The intention is the building is a 50-year building, so that the idea that it is, it is set up so that not only is, is the majority of it a very flexible, and we tried to limit the amount of partition space, or actually fixed walls that need to be there to allow Laura and Rebecca and their staff to be able to customize it in the way that they need. But those areas that are specific to the needs of, of broadcasting or the ability to do that have been incorporated into the concepts that are currently on the, on the drawing board. Okay, thank you. Thanks, yep. Tom. Um, just a couple other points, uh, and I know that the vote isn't until next week on this, but um, I, I loved uh, in Laura's, uh, Marlene's comments about, uh, and kind of paraphrasing, but um, that the goal is to meet the needs but exceed the expectations. And, and I think that's really, and this kind of ties into some of the comments and, and uh, Council uh, Vice President Palermo's comments about the whole library system is that, you know, we have had uh, comments about maybe the libraries not being funded to a, a level that um, that we should expect in our community. And I think this gives us that jumping off point, that opportunity to, to make the, the system that much better. I mean, we are going to have a state-of-the-art 150 million plus facility main library at, at, at the at, at not the heart of the city but the soul of the city is, as Tom said but um, have have that be the the heart of the the library system knowing that the investment and and how the other branches will work with that system are, are really what's going to improve our whole library system and and that's such a great asset for for the city of Omaha. And I, I, I will take a little note, um, President Festerson, you said that Heritage has a fairly good track record. Um, I, Laura, you don't, or, um, um, we don't have to have Rachel come up, but I can't think of a project where Heritage said we're going forward on that didn't get completed. So um, having, having said that, I, I, again, I'll, I, I talk a lot about the public-private partnerships, and much has been said about that here today as well, too. And, and it's really how we grow our city. Um, we have an incredible philanthropic and charitable community that's willing to invest in our community. Um, they expect the city of Omaha to be a partner in that, and I'm very willing to do so, um, especially, and I'll bring up the last two, uh, the last project that we've kind of mentioned a couple times today is the Riverfront Project. If, if I can take a dollar and get seven dollars in return off of that investment, I will do that every single day. And that's what we did for the Riverfront project. The city's committed to 50 million in, in a 400, $400 million dollar project. What we're being asked here today is uh, to make a, a public commitment of 20 million on 150 million dollars, and, and the math is essentially the same on that. That's about 13%, so a dollar to get $7 in return. Again, I would do that all day long, and for what will result, 
Um, after that, being a, an improved library system, state of the art and probably the envy of most cities in the country, I'm signing up all day long. Thank you. Thanks. And if I said fairly, your criticism was fair. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bagley, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. In, in the conversation we've had in, on this project that's been going on for a while, I, I've been at several meetings and the if you go to the website, omagcentrallibrary.org, that's great information there. And it's when you see the wow factor of the 72nd Dodge site, it, it really is beautiful, the work that's been put into it. But I don't want to take away from what's already been said. I'll reiterate it because I think it's important for people to know the things I took notes on and, and have heard in prior meetings. It's going to strengthen other libraries in our city. The staffing is going to increase to meet the demand. In fact, um, as an as a organized labor guy, you'd like to hear that they're going to raise the wages of people. They're going to be doing this work and recognizing the work they do, important things for the dignity of those workers. That other libraries are not going to suffer, I think that's very important to say. And I know in our library meeting with council members Rowe and Harding and I this morning with Laura, if you can comment briefly, even on, I don't want to forget other libraries, Councilman Palermo mentioned that, we don't want to forget about our other locations in some underserved communities or other parts of the city. The Willa Cather, we talked about that, Laura, this morning. Can you just repeat kind of what we talked about, what's going to be going on there in August? Um, in August, we'll be installing new carpeting and that will require a, probably a two to three week closure to get that work done. And um, we were able to coordinate with .com to get wiring installed at the same time so that we can also upgrade the phones from analog to VoIP. Thanks, appreciate you repeating that. And that's technology things that, that are gonna be addressed there. And I know the 72nd Dodge site with the orbit line and transportation and council member Fesserson made a good point on the pedestrian safety, there's things that that'll be looked at there and when this project, if it gets off the ground and goes forward, that those are the things that we'll keep our, our eye on. And, and lastly, the 1401 Jones site, um, we went through that several months ago and we don't wanna forget that that's gonna be serving our community in, in the future, whatever that looks like after five years, we don't ever wanna forget, we wanna have a great downtown library that'll take care of people and serve the needs of people down in several of our districts that are that are close to that. So I'll definitely be supporting this and I'll, I appreciate the effort that's been put into this. They've, a lot of information's been out there and, and I think this is a great project for 72nd Dodge, but again, other libraries are not gonna suffer from this as was put on the record today. Thank you. Thank you. And before we continue, can I just request that the, uh, there's a fairly loud bag of chips in the back there. <laughs> it's a bit distracting up here. If we could maybe step out if you're gonna continue snacking now. Okay, Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I would like to thank the Heritage Foundation um, for engaging the City Council in their project um, that will be at 72nd and Dodge. They did an outstanding job in communicating their efforts and their intentions on bringing something to Omaha, Nebraska for the good of Omaha, Nebraska. Secondly, I would like to thank or acknowledge all of the opponents for coming today and exercising your fundamental right, which is also known as democracy. I also would like to um, note that um, while this project is very unique and very uh, good for the city as a whole. I have to um, make a note that people in District 2 will still have some challenges enjoying this wonderful, amazing opportunity due to the lack of public transportation to those areas going north and south. But when I look at the project itself and what it gives to the whole community, again, I would have to say that this is great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowe, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I wanted to echo what uh, 
Mr. Begley said, be, be sure to look at omahacentrallibrary.org. Uh, Mr. Harding and uh, Begley and I were able to serve on the um, team that helped uh, put, these put this package together. And I wanted to give a shout out as well to the Margaret Sullivan team. They did a fantastic job of engaging the community uh, from, from all across the city, from every district, uh, to get input on uh, what the expectation was for a, for a new central library. And I think they knocked it out of the park. And, and I just wanted to give a shout out to Margaret and her team and to the rest of the team that put in so many hours of uh, work with Tom and people at Alley Pointer and, and just across the board. So thank you for all your, all your efforts on, the, on that work. Thank you. No further lights. I'll just thank everybody for being here with us today and thank you for your work on this project. Next item, please. Next item is item six, the preliminary plat for Evergreen, and the applicant has requested this item be withdrawn. Is there a motion to withdraw? Second. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Item seven, a resolution to approve the revised preliminary plat for Coventry, located northwest of 204th and Harrison Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number seven is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. Item seven is approved, seven to zero. Okay. Item eight, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Legato, located northeast of 204th and Harrison Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number eight is today. Proponents, please. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Mark Johnson. My address is 11440 West Center Road. I'm appearing today on behalf of the applicant, just here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any other proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 8 is approved 7 to 0. <coughs> Item 9, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Calarosa, located northeast of 216th Street and Mount Michael Road. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 9 is today. Proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Brent Beller, 1140, uh, here on behalf of the applicant, here for any questions on this initial preliminary plat. Thank you. Any other proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 9 is approved 7 to 0. Item 10, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Burshide subdivision located at 24645 Pacific Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. <coughs> Public hearing and vote on number 10 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 10 is approved, 7 to 0. Items 11 through 14 can be considered together for daybreak, located northeast of 192nd and Fort Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Items 11 and 12, ordinances to rezone this property from AG District to DR District and R4 District. Item 13, a resolution to approve the final plat. Item 14, a resolution to approve the subdivision agreement. Public hearing and vote on items 11, 12, 13, and 14 are today. Proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, Mark Johnson, 11440 West Center Road, here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any other proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? I'm Donnie Johnson, I'm Johnson the Question Foundation, North Omaha Concerned Citizen Foundation, 4928 North 52nd Street. Now, this here on 192nd, us baby boomers has been taught we don't rob Paul to pay Peter. And we keep seeing all this annexation of residential property going towards Elkhorn. So is this 192nd Northeast on Fort, which is moving into the area where we want to be, Bennington, uh, 
Washington County, and Elkhorn. Now, we talked to Mayor Fahey when he was mayor. He did get some land, but he, he used it for the city. Now, you all folks, you know that Nebraska was arguing for years, no casinos. But they finally passed it. Like surrounding states are saying yay to medical marijuana. Us baby boomers want to move on the outskirts of the city and look at this opportunity if it comes forward. But you guys keep building houses, more houses. And even Marty Schubert in the planning department said, look, we got to replace those jobs from the meatpacking plant. No one has been addressing that, but keep building the houses. So when are they going to readdress this, look at this whole process, especially us baby boomers? We don't believe in robbing Paul to pay Peter. We believe if they do finally pass this medical marijuana, which Nebraska is going to do it, they were just down in the unit camera who were screwing things up, like they moved the state fair to Grand Island because of their, their football program. All right, let's, so, stay on, let's stay on topic to 190 seconds well, quickly. Can you also tell us when are you folks going to talk to USDA and move them from Fremont to Omaha and then start looking at some of these baby boomers who want to move on the outskirts, like the library is coming forward. It's for the next generation. Like technology is beyond the technology you folks are talking about. Like the library down there, it's obsolete. So what we're saying to you folks, can you start looking at some of these USDA programs and the Peace Corps programs? That's what we want in North Omaha. And if you want to continue building houses and annexing this new land, Elkhorn and all that stuff, go ahead and build houses. But we need jobs. That's what we're complaining about, jobs. And that right now, that medical marijuana is the only thing that we're looking at for jobs. Thank you. Right. Any other opponents today? See none, public hearings closed. Roll call. Johnson, yes. Milton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. <laughs> Item 15, an ordinance to rezone property located at 2106 South 42nd Street from R4 District to R5 District. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 15 is today. Proponents, please. Fifteen? Mm -hmm. Proponents? Thank you, uh, Tim Benock, 3647 South 44th Ave. Thank you, Council President, members, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, as a sole owner and applicant, I'm requesting to rezone an empty lot at 2106 South 42nd Street from R4, single family residential, to R5, urban family residential. Uh, the area of 42nd Francis uh, is currently and largely a uh, mixed use area. Uh, to the east of across 42nd, you have Heartland Family Services. Uh, to the north, across Francis Street, you have um, a multi-family uh, apartment building. Uh, and then you have multiple duplexes that go south along 42nd. Um, and further, I'd like to emphasize that this request is in conjunction and it aligns with the City of Omaha's future land use plan. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other proponents on number 15? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Bagley, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. And Mr. Benak, can you come up for a minute, please? Oh, I'm sorry, are you an opponent? Yes. Please. Okay, please, I didn't see you back there. Please come up. I closed public hearing, but I'll recognize you. And then it's your name and address. Um, Scott Swankut, 2113 South 43rd Street. My concerns are the same as they were when we came before the planning department. Um, and I just want to pull up the, uh, I don't know what you call it, but the, the agenda for today. Sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, they state that, uh, and the planning department said that from R4 to R5 makes no difference. But his land um, isn't wide enough that it's, that according to the what the planner wrote, um, to put the duplex on that property. Um, and still have concerns about the drainage that's going to happen right now. I mean, just this year with the storms and the way the alley got messed up before, I mean, the drainage has been horrible. The erosion has been bad. And if he's going to use everybody's backyards and basements as a storm drain, I just, what concerns me is his plans didn't change at all between May and now. So, I mean, the, the same issue is still there. That's my concern. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bagley, the floor was yours. Thanks, Mr. President. And uh, was it Scott? I'm sorry. Is that? Yes. Okay. Um, I appreciate you being here today. I, I spoke to Mr. Bannock, if you want to come up. Tim, uh, there was a letter in opposition in addition to what Scott just mentioned today. Um, I had a conversation with Mr. Brian Nickel, 
who can't be here today, but I had a good conversation with him this morning in uh, regards to the letter he sent. And I won't read the whole letter, but basically it was, I'll just read a, a sentence. I request the city council to require the duplex owner and builder to fashion the finished alley and driveway to drain rainwater away from my property and our neighbors. And he owns a property at 2105 South 43rd Street. So um, what he was asking for going forward, this is a rezoning only today, obviously, but Tim, when you go forward with the process, if you start building this, are you willing to talk to the neighbors as the owner of this property you want to build to, to address any issues they have with water runoff? Thank you, Councilman Bailey. Um, absolutely. I, I live in the neighborhood. I live on 44th and Grover. I work on 42nd and Grover. I'm, I'm invested in the area. Um, I want to be happy and I want my neighbors to be happy. Um, and in cons um, concerning the, um, the, the lot is not wide enough. Um, if you vote yes today, that just gives me the opportunity to go in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals um, and discuss that issue further. Um, and then the zoning of R5, it, it, does, it does maintain a, a maximum impervious coverage of 60%, um, and the proposal is, is well below that. Um, and it is, I don't plan on touching the alley. Um, that will remain, um, remain grass. Um, but it is important to have the driveway in the backyard uh, to keep the arterial street of 42nd, uh, the, keep the traffic flowing safely. Um, so it is important to have um, the driveway in the backyard, but the, the concrete driveway will butt up to a grass alley that will not be touched. Okay. Thank you. And, and again, going forward with Mr. Nickel or Scott that was here today, you have no problem having conversation with them because neighbors don't want any flooding, obviously, and I can certainly understand that, and I know you appreciate that. So you live close by here. You don't live in California or Seattle or Florida. You're available right here, so any conversation need to be had. Are you committed today to have those with the neighbors to make sure any of their concerns are, are addressed and, and you talk to them about it? Absolutely. Okay. Like I said, I want to be happy and I want my neighbors. Uh, yeah, I'm invested in the area. I want my neighbors to be happy. Okay, thanks. I, that's Thank all you. the question I have, Mr. Benak. Thank you. Thank you. No further delays. And I'll make a motion to support this. Motion and a second. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Hardy, Mr. President. Yes. Item 15 is approved, seven to zero. Item 16, an ordinance to rezone property located at 3106 South 3rd Street from R4 District to R5 District. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 16 as today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Second, roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Mr. President. Yes. And 16 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 17, an ordinance to rezone property located at 10935 Mockingbird Drive from CC District to GI District. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 17 is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon, my name is Frank Bevins. My address is 20455 E Street, Elkhorn, Nebraska. Uh, this is my property, so I'm here with my architect to answer any questions as needed. Great, thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Motion a second, roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. Item 17 is approved, 7 to 0. Item 18, an ordinance to rezone property located at 10435 North 84th Street from AG District to DR District. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 18 is today. Proponents, please. Sophia Starsik with Fraser Martis Architects, 1005 South 76th Street, here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any other proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Donnie R. Johnson, 
the Johnson Equestrian Foundation, North Omaha Concerned Citizen Foundation, 4928 North 52nd Street. Again, Mr. Fredson, this is changing agriculture district to development, and we're fighting for survival in North Omaha, and we're looking at down the road, they're going to be passing this state of Nebraska medical marijuana, war, and you guys giving up all the land, and you won't even annex the land. I talked to the Blair County Commissioner, and they asked me, why do I want land put over in Douglas County? I said, because you folks in Washington County act like those folks in Washington, D.C., and we can trust the people in Douglas County. But if you guys keep giving up the land, and then when they do pass the law, how are we going to grow? Are we going to be able to grow medical marijuana in the city when they pass the law? So you should keep this in mind as y'all move forward that this is going to happen. Like the casinos finally came, this is going to pass. If you could look into the future, that unit camera down there, when they get rid of that governor we have, that he ain't doing nothing for the eastern part of the state. I hope the new governor does, because I ask him all the time, when are you going to do something for the eastern part of the state? They don't have no answer. The answer for us is that we have to look in this process and look forward. When they do pass this, all the land around here that we're trying to get, we need the USDA and the Peace Corps to participate in some prog programs in North Omaha to help us so we won't have to rob Paul to pay Peter. This is what we're trying to get in front of you folks as we move forward. And hopefully these things will make some sense down the road. Like that library down there, I knew it was obsolete when they built it. Our school teacher took us down there. So, Donnie, we're talking about a rezoning at 100 and, on, on 84th Street, right? I look, I'm looking at all that land. The land that you, when you got uh, Annex Elkhorn. Okay, got you. Now, you remember that land? That you, when you, do we have to buy on the other side of Elkhorn to, to grow crops? Or do we be on this side of Elkhorn? The east side or the north? Or where is it? The west side? Because Elkhorn is annexed to the city now. And if you go into Bennington, there's land there. All right. Can I have you summarize about the rezoning here? Yeah. Would you start looking in the process of bringing the Peace Corps into our programs in North Omaha and the USDA in Fremont? Call them and tell them we want an office here, and then we'll get some land. The main bottom line is, Mr. President, your Benson district is doing well. We're starving in North Omaha, and the reason why is because there's no jobs. And we're saying that there is a job. Surrounding states are saying yay to medical marijuana. Right. Why Nebraska saying yay? We're not, we're not talking about medical marijuana, okay. yet, Donnie, but thank you for your testimony. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a Any other day, opponents so. on number 19, number 18, I'm sorry. Seeing none, public hearings closed. I'll, I will just ask, since you're here, it, this is a residential addition we're talking about, right? To this Correct. Point. There's those al already a home on the property. We've uh, received an impact study for this, if there are any questions on that, um, but it is just to allow for a main level uh, bedroom to be on the split level home so that uh, someone could age in place. Of a current single family house. Correct. Right. Thank you. Is there a motion? Yes. Roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 18 is approved seven to zero. Item 19, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the MCC district to incorporate into that district the property located southwest of 192nd Street and Grant Avenue. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 19 is today. Proponents, please. Kyle Hazy with ENA Consulting Group, 10909 Mill Valley Road, representing the applicant. I'll make myself available for any questions the council might have. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 19 is approved 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 20, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the MCC overlay district to incorporate into that district the property located at 5203 and 5213 Leavenworth Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 20 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Motion Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 20 is approved 7 to 0. Item 21, in ordinance to approve a major amendment to PUR Overlay District located southwest of 44th and Douglas Streets, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 21 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Motion Roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. 
Item 22, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the ACI district to incorporate into that district the property located at 2602 North 24th Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 22 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Motion to approve. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. M22 is approved, 7 to 0. M's 23 and 24 can be considered together for property located at 5100 South 93rd Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. M23 in ordinance to rezone this property from R3 District to R4 District. M24 in ordinance to amend the boundaries of the MCC Overlay District to incorporate this property into that district. Public hearing and vote on number 23 and 24 are today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon. Joe's Dana with Lamper Nearson, 14710 West Dodge, on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. Any other proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Please come down. I do apologize for before, sir. Um, That's okay. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's, it's not. It's Hopefully the chips were good. <laughs> okay. Um, I just one question was, you Your know. Your name and address, there, please, for the record. Is there anything I could say that would stop the rezoning from three to four. Well, you need your name and address for the record, please. I'm sorry, 5022, uh, Jeff Stein, 5022 South 93rd Street, Omaha, Nebraska, fourth house down from the uh, Mockingbird grade school. Okay, and you're hearing us as an opponent to number 23 and 24? You know, it's hard to say because, you know, I, I'm not against it per se, but I just think this is the, you know, the horse is pushing the cart in front of it because, you know, you guys are already building, you know, wonderful school and, you know, going to do some wonderful stuff there. But now you're asking me whether I can go from three to four. And you've already are in the process of building a facility that's going to do that anyways. And now you're asking me for permission. I, I was just confused. Is it me? It could be, you know. But don't you really ask first whether or not this should be rezoned a three to four? rather than, you know, you're building a four facility and now you're asking me to say, do I, do I object? I apologize. I don't know if I do or not. I just, I just a little upset about the, you know, the process. If you were going to do this and go from, you know, three to four, you should have done that first, not while you're already building a four facility. And, and so I'm just making a statement. I, I apologize. I don't mean, you know, if, if I'm wrong. I got you. We'll have the applicant address that maybe here in a second. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yep. Thanks. You can stick around if you want to. I any other opponents on these items? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I, applicant, if you could come back up. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Certainly. Yeah, Joe Zdina with Lamper Nearson, 14710 West Dodge. Nice to meet you. Thank um, you. Tell me about the process of how you got to this point sure. on the agenda. Yep. Uh, so we uh, we had several meetings with the city staff. The item 24 was requested by the city just because it kind of increases the aesthetics of the building that they're going to be building, the Ralston Public School. So Ralston Public Schools is the applicant. Um, and then we found through doing multiple school projects you're, you're usually operating in a residential district. And if we can increase from an R3 to an R4, it gives us some flexibility, say for instance, for a pre-K addition in the future, not to have to come back and rezone. It allows us to build and not exceed those zoning uh, coverages for impervious or building coverage and otherwise. So uh, we kind of look to the future uh, a bit so that we can avoid having to come up multiple times. R3, I mean, we, we could certainly, we've seen elementary schools in five, R5s and R6s, so we just, bump it up one, give us an opportunity for future expansion of additions for the school should the district grow or have additional needs in the future. And you've uh, met with city staff before you came today in front of the council, correct? Yes, sir. We had a pre-application meeting with the city. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, here's what I know. If you can give your card to that gentleman in the back, yep. usually that communication solves a lot of the issues. Yes. Um, it didn't sound like he was so much a to the project, but maybe needing <laughs> some more information to help him out. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make a motion to approve 23 and 24, but on your way out, if you give me your card, that you would be You bet. I would be happy to. Oh, thank you. Yes. Motion and a second. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Thank you. 
Items 25 through 27 can be considered together for property located southeast of 38th Avenue and Dodge Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. M25, an ordinance to rezone this property from R8 District to TOD 2MX. M26, an ordinance to approve a PUR overlay district. Item 27, an ordinance to rescind the ACI overlay district. Public hearing and votes on numbers 25, 26, and 27 are today. Proponents, please. Hi there, Josh Hannum, 1410 North Saddle Creek, part of the development team. I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Motion a second. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. And 28, a resolution to approve a special use permit to allow a broadcast tower in the CC district with a waiver to section 55-366 height located at 799 North Skyline Drive. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number 28 is today. Proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Sean Hempstead with GSS representing High Tech Towers at 4432 McKinley Avenue. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. M28 is approved seven to zero. Item 29, to consider a Class I liquor license for Porky Butts Barbecue, located at 15475 Ruggle Street, Suite 114. Public hearing and vote on number 29 is today. Proponents, please. Mr. President, uh, members, uh, Mike Kelly, 2804 South 87th Avenue. Uh, this is a party room in the same complex, but we need a new license to, to, to put it there. And with that, we're here for any other questions you might have. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. M29 is approved, seven to zero. Item 30, to consider a Class D liquor license for Quick Shop 350799, located at 2202 North 90th Street, Ace Communication. Public hearing and vote on number 30 is today. We have the applicant by Zoom, Mr. Burke. We'll get you off mute here in a minute. All right, try that. Yeah, it's Robert Burke, uh, district manager for Quick Shop. Omaha, Nebraska. And your address? Uh, North 90th. Is that, is that close enough for the clerk? 3806 South 14th, Omaha, Nebraska. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Motion and a second. Roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe. As for your address, not to show. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. And 30 is approved, 7 to 0. So the item was approved. Uh, so your testimony was very effective. <laughs> Thank you. Consent agenda. Any member of the City Council may cause any item placed on the consent agenda be removed. Items removed from the consent agenda shall be taken up by the City Council immediately following the consent agenda in the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by the City Council rules of order. Well, remove number 31 from this consent agenda. Uh, there's been a request to lay that item over. So first, we'll address items 32 through 38 who had their public hearing on June 28th. Is there a motion? Motion and a second. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Item number 31. Um, I don't know if Mr. Uh, Stubbe would like to request to uh, address this item or if Mr. Thompson's still here. I think the issue is just a two week layover request to fulfill a CC1 obligation. Is that correct? Bob Stubbe, Public Works. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Motion and a second. Okay. Okay, second meeting. Yep. Okay. Motion and a second. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. 
Palermo. Yes. Roe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Okay. Um, we're going to take number 57 off the consent agenda. I think we may have some family members here or someone representing that street renaming item uh, here to speak to that specifically. So first, we'll take the public hearings on items number 39 through 56 and 58 through 78 today. If you address, wish to address the city council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address, identify yourself by name, address, who you represent, and if you are a proponent or an opponent. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here to address agenda item 65. Um, I'm Alicia Christensen uh, with Together. I'm the director of policy and advocacy there. The address is 812 South 24th Street. And I just wanted to um, express my appreciation on behalf of Together and say um, that we appreciate the approval of this community development block grant program. Safe housing is a basic human right and this allows us to provide essential uh, case management services and assistance to uh, Omaha families and individuals who uh, need to have a safe place to call home. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else here to address these items? Hi, my name is Joseph Gitter. I'm here to uh, address uh, item number 70. Uh, I'm in opposition to that. Um, my company is Bohemian Photo Works, which is named in part for my ancestors who came to Omaha in the 1870s. Uh, we provide photography, videography, and creative service, uh, cl services to clients throughout the Omaha area. We're recognized by the city of Omaha as an emerging small business, and we're also an SBA hub zone, certified hub zone. Uh, in the fall of 2018, uh, I left my job as a senior executive at a federal agency and moved from Washington, D.C. to Omaha to start a small business. I could have lived anywhere, but I believe that Omaha would be a great place to start a business. A guiding principle of Bohemian Photo Works is to give back to the community and like a lot of small businesses, we were hit hard by the pandemic, yet we chose to donate our portrait session fees to a local school, uh, food bank. We also tried to help the morale of UNMC nurses on the front line of fighting COVID by offering complimentary portraits. Uh, more recently, uh, I've been applying my teaching experience uh, as an instructor at the Washington DC School of Photography and as an adjunct professor at uh, photography at Bellevue University to help uh, mentor and train promising photographers and videographers who are from underrepresented communities within the Omaha area. So um, when the opportunity came up uh, for the uh, Omaha Public Library pr promotional videography project, uh, I thought that was a great fit. Last year, uh, my company uh, produced over 70 videos for the state of Nebraska. I do have a sort of a reference letter attached. Um, I, I thought it was a great opportunity. Uh, we submitted a proposal. And when I saw the notice of intent that OPL was awarding the contract to another entity, um, I requested feedback from OPL. I received no feedback, uh, despite two emails to OPL. So after two weeks, um, I submitted a request for public records so I could see the winning bid. And much to my surprise, the winning bid uh, was $28,000 more than my bid. I had the lowest bid. So in situations like this, I tried to put my, myself in the shoes of other stakeholders. So first, as a tax-paying citizen of Omaha, it, it bothers me that the city is spending $28,600 extra on promotional videos that could be put to better use, such as buying computer equipment for the Omaha Cent Central uh, Public Library. And we've heard a lot of things about great plans for that. As an owner of a tier one emerging small business, I consider the experience that I had with OPL as sort of a slap in the face. 
Uh, as you're all aware, the language in the city ordinance clearly states, and I'm quoting here, the city shall make every good faith effort feasible to utilize small and emerging, emerging small businesses in all city contracts. However, from what I can determine, um, those objectives are only administered when it's convenient to the department. The feedback that I received from OPL when I eventually did get the VAC was due to the condensed timeline of the project, they awarded the proposal based on the resources available from the vendor that they selected, and they wanted to ensure that there would be several team members committed to working on all aspects of the project, uh, regardless of any unforeseen circumstances. Um, I believe my company has a proven track record of completing complex and comprehensive videography projects. And I believe that our proposal was dismissed in part because we didn't list a multitude of employees uh, working on the project. As a small emerging business, I have, to be, I have to make sure that we run lean and agile and rely on contractors as necessary. That doesn't mean that we're any less reliable. In fact, because of my connections with professional photographers, photographers of Nebraska, um, we have access to a vast network of some of the top photographers and videographers in the state of Nebraska. So if OPL had a concern about this, they could have requested a meeting. That was an option in the timeline. They did not request a meeting. They did not even check my references. From the perspective of OPL, I would want to make sure that they were being open and transparent as possible in selecting a vendor for this project, especially considering some of the recent criticism about not being open and transparent. I think this was a lost opportunity for OPL to be transparent. Section 10.141 of the city ordinance states, and I know you're all familiar with this, all contracts in, ex in excess of $20,000 whether the consideration therefore is to be paid by or to the city shall be approved by resolution of the council. I'm gonna ask if you take a look at your package and you look at the timeline in front of you, there was no timeline for this comp for OPL coming to the city council requesting approval of this. And it was only after I contacted two city council members that I got notified by the city clerk that they were adding it to the city council agenda. I don't know if this is a gross oversight on the part of OPL or if it was a deliberate attempt to evade city requirements for the sake of expediency. In any event, I, I believe it further erodes trust in OPL. And I wanna make it clear that I really do support the Omaha Public Library as an institution. As a boy growing up in North Omaha in the Miller Park neighborhood, we didn't have encyclopedias. So when I wanted to do a school report, I had to walk a two and a half mile round trip to the uh, North Omaha uh, Public Library branch uh, at near 29th and Ames. And I made that trip probably a couple of times a week. I believe that access to a library when I was younger has helped me become a lifelong learner. And I do support the plans for a new central library and for moving the downtown branch. But I believe that the enigmatic approach that OPL took regarding this contract undermines their credibility and further erodes public trust. Therefore, I am requesting the City Council defer a decision on this resolution until an independent review of the selection process has been completed. In the longer term, I'm asking the City Council to evaluate how it can remove some of the obstacles for currently facing emerging small businesses starting with the uh, current contracting process. The language in the city ordinance concerning emerging small businesses isn't really worth the paper that's written on unless it translates to tangible outcomes. Small, innovative businesses and creatives like my company are struggling to stay afloat because of the increased costs associated with doing business, especially increased taxes. In the, the Mastercraft building where my studio is located, our real estate taxes have increased 200% over the last four years. And that gets translated to increased overhead costs for a small business owner. I would hope Omaha, like other cities, would not only take the necessary steps to remove obstacles to growth, 
but to promote the growth of startups. I believe that these steps are critical if Omaha is to reach its full potential as a city that is favorable to startups. I appreciate uh, your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. I know we have a light on, and also the library director is still with us, so I'm, I'm sure we'll have some further conversation about this item. But before I close the public hearings, are there anyone else here to address numbers 39 through 56 or 58 through 78? I have a little extra hard of hearing today. If I misunderstand you, I apologize. But on number 65, I am opposed to this. I've never heard of family housing advisory services. I've heard of a lot of agencies around to help people in need. I wonder if this is a duplication of some services already available and exactly for who and why. Uh, or is it creating a new nonprofit for the city of Omaha and the county? The county had such programs on their agenda earlier today and in the past. Are we duplicating something that the county already does? Uh, is there an agency for an old person like me to get mortgage assistance, to get property tax assistance? If you're assisting on everything else, it seems like you would on property tax. Uh, it's not your problem, I guess, it's the county, but you can maybe help me out with the county. Uh, particularly if I am affected by a cold during COVID. This doesn't say ARPA dollars, but I wonder if there are ARPA dollars involved in this because everybody's running for the money while it's available. Problem is, when the money runs out, uh, somebody's going to have to cough up to keep these agencies that are being created and these services to keep them running. And if you can't, people will be getting angry about that. So you need to think about how much you're giving away, why, and how many people are giving it away. Don't duplicate. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further testifiers, I'm going to close the public hearing. Yes? Okay, come on down if you want to testify on these items. Good afternoon. Pat Evans, City Planning Department, here to address item number 65 and the questions that perhaps people have. I am a proponent. These funds are CBG. COVID dollars that were allocated to the city in, in uh, 2020 for the express purpose of rental assistance and mortgage assistance. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's the only services that these funds could provide. They were originally allocated to Match, who was unable to fulfill their contract. We deobligated it from Match and then awarded FAST. That's what this agreement is Family Advisory Housing Services to do uh, what the funds were intended to do. The, it is not a duplication of benefit. It does provide rental assistance that has been provided through ARP and ERAP and other kinds of funding that came to the city to assess people under duress and unable to pay their rent through the COVID period. Any funds that are allocated to individuals for rental assistance, whether that be current rent or arrears or uh, utilities or arrears and utilities um, are not duplication of what they've already received, but perhaps a continuation of what they need. It is up to a maximum of three months of assistance, and uh, they do have to income qualify under CDBG. There is quite a bit of documentation that also has to be done, unlike some of the previous uh, funding sources that were available. So. Uh, Matt, uh, excuse me, Family Housing Advisory Services will be using these funds through next year. These funds have a sunset date, basically uh, August 2023. We have to expend 80% of our COVID dollars. Everything that is spent has to be directly related to COVID and the results of COVID influences. So there are quite a bit of instruction, uh, restrictions on this funding that were perhaps not as restrictive on the other funding. So there is 
procedures through HUD to assure that there is not duplication of benefit, that people are not receiving the same kind of funds at the same time. There is a system within HUD where you can check where people have received other fundings from. These perhaps are returning people or people that have yet to receive assistance for both of those things, either mortgage or rental assistance or utility assistance. Okay. Thank you. Here to answer any questions. Appreciate that. I'm gonna close the public hearing on these items. Um, I, would, I would call out two items that I'll be supporting today in this grouping, which is number 66, which is new equipment to the Gallagher, Gallagher Pool at Gallagher Park. Uh, it starts what will be uh, over a million dollars worth of public improvements to that park and great for that neighborhood. And then number 55, which we talked about this morning a little bit, and the importance of completing uh, what will be an enhancement to our Complete Streets Master Plan item. Uh, which is to create an appendix that addresses new street lights and street trees throughout the city, which I think are really important to our, the look and feel of our city. I just had one question on that for Mr. Stubbe, who's talking at the moment, which is if, this, if that contract is approved today, what's the time frame for getting those results back and then back to the council? This is number 55, the street trees and, and street lighting. Do you need a minute? <laughs> I'm looking at the contract, and I don't see anything that pops up to me right away that indicates as far as when they're supposed to provide that information back to us. Okay. What would your expectation be, your estimate of that be? Um, because of the fact that there's a number of tasks that are associated with this uh, for, for two different components, one being street lights and the other one being street trees, I would anticipate probably six to nine months. Okay. Thank you. I know Councilmember uh, Johnson had her light on to address number 70, right? You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, item number 70, do we have anyone, a member of staff of city that can speak to this item? Uh, Ms. Marlene's on Zoom, if you wanna ask the library director. Um, yes, Ms. Marlene. Um, Mr. Gittier um, came to the um, podium to uh, talk about his bid um, for the work. Um, can you elaborate on that? Um, I know that I had put some information, uh, I sent an email um, inquiring about some of his concerns regarding the fact that um, the interpretation of the bid was that he would um, complete the work as a solo agent and that perhaps he did not have any additional staff. Um, after um, looking into that, um, there was uh, information coming back from your desk indicating that you had a new staff member that perhaps was somewhat um, not familiar with the process of bidding and there was somewhat of an oversight uh, maybe perhaps she should have reached out to um, Mr. Uh, Gittier um, for uh, um, for more information regarding the number of staff that he had. So can you speak to that, please? Yes, certainly. Um, my marketing manager, Emily Getchman, worked with the purchasing department to craft the RFP. Um, once all the bids were in, she put together a selection committee and she selected Dundee Digital as the best lowest bid. Um, the, one of the primary factors was the number of team members involved in working on the project. We have a, a really quick deadline to meet and she wanted to make sure that there were enough people working on the project that there would be no delays. And Mr. Gittier's application said that he was the only person who would be working on this project and he would have a voiceover actor as well. He did not mention contracting out any of this work. So based on those applications, Dundee Digital had the best lowest bid um, and they're able to, to meet our deadline. And just as a point of clarification, um, the funds for this project are coming from our foundation. So they're not 
taxpayer funds. Um, and if this is held over, we will not be able to complete the project on the deadline that we had outlined. Uh, Ms. Marlene, um, I, I understand that. Um, however, um, in underserved communities such as um, the area in which this um, is being done or completed at, um, we're concerned about giving everyone an opportunity to get a leg up. And so um, we have asked the city of Omaha to provide us with a digital or electronic bidding process that will, in, that will allow us to um, mitigate some of these uh, misunderstandings that we have oftentimes. So, um, and then we have a new uh, employee and your response back was that perhaps they were green in their decision making? Um, no, uh, Emily is not a new employee. She's been with our organization for quite some time. This was the first RFP she had worked on directly, but again, it was under the guidance of the purchasing department and this is what they do all the time. Um, Emily looked at the bids and selected the best lowest bid. Uh, Mr. Gittier spelled out very clearly in his application that he was the only person who would be working on this. And while we always do our best to reach out and work with um, SEBs, um, I, from the information I had, that was also not on his original application. So we went with the company that could best meet the needs of the project, and that was Dundee Digital. So um, when you're evaluating um, the individuals for a project, um, do you just look at face value of their application? You don't explore further, you don't make phone calls, or more importantly, after uh, Mr. Gittier has raised this confusion um, or this concern that there was a misunderstanding that he does have more than one person employed. Is there a plan to address that going forward in other decisions that we make um, in the future? Uh, there is no plan at this point in time. Uh, I can reach out to the purchasing department to see if there are guidelines we could put together to address these issues when they come up again. Um, but Emily worked with the information she was given and Mr. Gittier did not provide the information that was needed for him to win the project. I, I would recommend that we uh, explore uh, expanding that because again, the importance of uh, getting a wider pool of opportunities is very important and essential um, to giving individuals a leg up in our communities that are underserved I think that we should do a better job business when we use business models that we should do a better job at uh, making sure that we're not assuming and interpreting um, things um, simply because of an application. I would think that we would want to um, at least make a phone call or do a positive handoff exchange with the person that put in the application. Well, that is something we will definitely do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Melton, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, and I, I just wanted to confirm, I, I, because I think that the process is, if you don't, if you wanna appeal the bid rejection, rejection, can you do that? Or is this a case at Bernard, I don't know, Bernard or Mr. Cousy, Bernard, can you please explain the difference because I think this is something that's a specialized, it, it's advertising. So I know it's not necessarily just the lowest bid. It's not just, you know, putting concrete down um, to fix sidewalks. Although I have to say this council has picked uh, not the lowest bid before and denied someone who's done a bad job in the past. I don't think we have that case here. What we have is specialized is this like advertising or promotion? Yeah. So would this be different than, let's for, say, a concrete contract? 
Bernard and Bush, Deputy City Attorney. So I, I, there's a underlying misunderstanding, I think, that occurs. And I think Ms. Marlene, her testimony continued to perpetuate that a misunderstanding. Yeah. We do put out requests for bids, which uh, this is what we want to have done, a concrete project, whatever else. And it doesn't have, the, the presumption when you put out for a bid is that it all you put out specifications so that everybody who puts in for the bid can perform that work to those specifications and that's all that's required. And in those cases, we do have an SCB program that's implicated, that's something that's part of the process and you do choose the lowest and best bid. This was not a request for bid. This was a request for a request for professional services, an RFP. And what that does is you put out a say, hey, this is what we'd like to do and it allows you to evaluate not only price, that's obviously one thing that's important, but also the resources the party has, their, their background, uh, their experience, the credentials they have, the references they have, all those things can be considered. And you choose somebody because they have, at least in your view, the professional services that better fit what you're attempting to accomplish for your particular department. Now, not everything can go out as an RFP. That's sometimes a debate, and that's one of the areas that you work with purchasing on is determining what types of projects have to be a bidding process, what have to be a request for professional services. And the city has a lawyer, Mr. Wieson, who works with them on that, answers questions, and provides guidance in that particular case. But that's, there appears to be a fundamental, price is obviously important, but when it comes to awarding an RFP, it is not the sole consideration where frequently when you're talking about bidding projects where, hey, you just have to meet this certain level and presumption is all these different companies can do it, uh, price is the ultimate decider. When you're talking about professional services and when Ms. Marlene discussed it, she certainly discussed another a number of elements, the ability to do it, timeliness, number of people, experience that would, would play into consideration. And I don't I don't dispute Ms. Johnson's comments about the need to make sure that we have a wide variety of people responding to RFP requests, whatever else. But to talk about the SCB program in this context, it doesn't apply to RFPs uh, the way it's written currently. So uh, that's a little bit of a distraction. I'm more familiar with this than I normally would be because there was a couple of public records responses. I did speak with Mr. Gitter on the phone uh, in, in, in that regard as well because uh, I provided him some documents and they called and asked some follow-up questions. And I did explain that to him in my phone conversation as well. Well, and that goes back to, I know that there was an allegation made that made it look like the library department was gonna try and hide this. And I'm looking at just what's available to us, which um, says the schedule of events, this went out to all of the people that were putting a proposal in and it actually had a timeline. It states that the Number seven, that the final recommended selection would be done approximately June 15th, 2022. And then the contract award date would be approximately June 22nd, 2022. And it looks like Ms. McFarlane did sign it in a timely manner, even though it just said approximately on 613, 2022. And that was the letter to the Omaha City Council indicating it was being sent to the City Council we put on our agenda. Now we have had the last two weeks off so I understand that then, by the way, it was her signature first, Mayor Stothert, um, Franklin Thompson, and also Steve Curtis signed it, and they, it's all original. So those yeah. three people, other three people signed it on different days. So by the time the fourth person signed it, and then it came to council, we had the two weeks off. So mm -hmm. I just wanna say that when you throw allegations out there that, that we were gonna basically violate city ordinances, when I look at the dates and I look at the signatures, and it was the signatures on the letter giving it to the council for our vote. I just wanted yeah. to see if you have any response to that because there was absolutely no indication that I see that this was ever gonna go, not come before us for a vote as the allegation was, was laid. Well, and, and I don't, I'm not aware of any indication that it wasn't gonna come for your vote. And again, I, I don't know the relevant, the relative merits of the different companies. I'm not opining one way or the other as to whether this is the best or the not best. That's not. This is really a process discussion. Um, and the other reason the bid, bid rejection wasn't available because it wasn't a bid. So there isn't an ability to appeal to this I body. Think, and yeah. and uh, I think there's some understanding. I'm guessing the clerk's office had some discussion uh, about that. Um, at least from the time that I got involved in the regards to the public records request would have been 
of the 20th to 25th of June, there was no question uh, that it was going to council, and frankly, that that was Mr. Gitter was made aware of that during my phone conversation. I believe I even, in the documents I provided in response to his request, provided a copy of the council the document that was going to council in late June, even though obviously it didn't show up on the agenda uh, until the agenda was published for this meeting last Thursday. Okay. But I did provide him a copy of it because by that point it had been signed by all the parties. And, and I didn't, even though it technically wasn't a public record until it's published, I felt it was appropriate that he receive a copy of it. Right, and that that's also attached. It was attached to our agenda, as they all are, every, every single one. It's a, a letter from the mayor um, to the city council and it has the department head and everybody else. And that's for every bid, every proposal, everything we vote on every week, those are attached. So that's how I was able to just in five minutes, look back at the timeline, look back to see when people signed it. And it was signed immediately, meaning they were immediately sending it to the city council as soon as the decision was made. So thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, and I, I understand, I have one more question, um, Laura, Marlene, are you still there? Yes. Um, and there was something about, you know, small businesses, which I understand and I I agree. I like giving small businesses the business, but is um, I, I, I'm not, a, I don't know the individuals that um, apply, but it seems to me that most of these were all small businesses in our community. Do you, is Dundee Digital, uh, to your knowledge, a small business in Omaha? Yes. Okay. Thank I don't you. know that they're an SEB formally with the city, but they are a small local business. This was for videography, correct? A professional service for videography? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have no, nothing. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Yes. Uh, Mr. Gidier, are you still somewhere? Okay. Yeah. Just one thing I wanted to clarify. If you go Mr. to, an address again for um, the I'm sorry, yeah, this is Joseph Gitter, uh, and my business address is 1111 North 13th Street. Um, if, if you go into the city's website and you look at bids and requests for proposals, and I challenge you to do this, look at every request for proposal, it has a timeline in there. And on that timeline, it will include a step that requires going to city council. That was not on this timeline, and that's why I was not sure this was going to city council. So I didn't have any communication back from the Omaha Public Library. Um, quite frankly, I'm I'm new to this process, so it was a learning experience for me. So I was I did not see that in the and it's not in the timeline. But if you go to any other RFP, if you go to the city's website, it will be in that timeline. So for some reason, it was left off the timeline. And that was my point. It was left off the timeline. I'm not accusing any, anybody. I don't know what happened. Uh, it may have been just an oversight on the part of OPL, but it was not on the original timeline. And it, would ha it should have been, because it is on every other RFP original timeline. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, yeah, I, I did say in the, in the um, uh, application, or the proposal, rather, that I was the only other person in addition to the professional sound actor. Um, I did not think it was going to take more than one person to do, quite frankly. Uh, last year for the state of Nebraska, as I said, uh, I created 70 videos over a four-month period. Um, if I were to run into problems, and I did end up contracting four photographers to help me out, um, but I, I truly am working with uh, photographers and videographers in the underserved community, and if I don't get projects to work on, I can't, I can't have them help me. Okay, and that, that was the basis for that statement. Um, so my, my message regarding the small uh, emerging small business is that if it only applies to uh, subcontractors working on construction contracts, I don't think that's good enough. I think I would really appreciate if the city council could take another look at how emerging small businesses are being used in all contracts within the city, which is which is currently what the language in the states um, in in the uh, in the city um, charter 
not the charter, but the, I'm sorry, <laughs> in, in the, um, well, I have it quoted here. Right now, that language is, it's in my testimony, but it is currently reflected um, as in the language it discusses small businesses, but I don't really believe that if it's only being applied to subcontractors working on construction projects, that's really sufficient enough. If you really want to support emerging small businesses, uh, I think it's important to include or at least consider having departments consider emerging small businesses. And at the end, they may not be the best fit, I understand that, but at least have them take a hard look because I felt that Certainly, OPL had an opportunity to reach out to me, and they and they didn't do that. And I, I think, in a perfect world, that would have happened. So, that's it. Okay, uh, Mr. Gidier, um I just wanted to uh, make sure that after we've had all these this conversation about your concern about this process, um, are you satisfied with the outcome and the information that was given back to you um, by OPL? Um, I know that it, I mean, you're, this is your first time, this right. is a learning process, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to gain that understanding and at the same time share with the OPL um, that perhaps there was a better way to do business uh, as it relates to your concern. I just wanted to give you that opportunity to discuss that, and now at this time I want to make sure that you understand why um, their decision was um, as is. I, I appreciate that. Um, I have experience reviewing contracts at the federal level. I've managed projects with billion dollar implications in my prior career. And you know, I, I really didn't believe that this video would require more than, than two people, which is what I had in my contract, uh, in my uh, proposal rather. Um, but I think that when I sent the email to OPL and I requested feedback, and they waited two weeks to give me feedback, and the feedback was basically you, you didn't have enough people, we didn't think you had enough people to work on the project. Um, I would have liked an opportunity earlier in the process. There is a, something in the timeline that, that talks about um, interviews with the uh, bid or the proposal submitters. Uh, if necessary, and I think in this case they it would be it would have been better if they had reached out to me and asked me those questions. Um, I'm certainly going to take this as a learning experience, but I do think there's more that, that can be done for emerging small businesses, not just in the construction area, but throughout all city contracts, which is what the language currently states. So thank you for bringing this to our attention. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Palermo. You're recognized. Disregard. Okay. Disregard. No further lights on these items. And this is 39 through 56, 58 through 78. There's a motion and a second. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. N57, a resolution to approve a commemorative street name of Richard Brown Avenue on Patrick Avenue from 34th Street to 35th Street. Public hearing on number 57 is today. Proponents, please. I'm not sure if we have any family members or representatives of Richard Brown here today. Don't see any. All right. Any other proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm just going to go ahead and read um, what we have here um, as it relates to the resolution on this street renaming. Uh, Richard Papa Bear Brown dedicated over 35 years of his life to the North Omaha community, impacting numerous lives along the way. He was employed by the Wesley House Community Center for 25 years, as well as Franklin Elementary School for 10 years. Brown taught and coached youth sports at Wesley House and also served as the youth director of USA Wrestling Nebraska. 
Richard helped lead Omaha South to three straight state championships in wrestling as well as the 1957 championship in football. After high school, he wrestled for Iowa State and finished third in the Big A tournament in 1960. This commemorative designation would honor Mr. Brown on Patrick Avenue from 34th Street to 35th Street. I move that we go ahead and um, uh, accept this resolution um, with the recommendation to um, edit the resolution to, since this is a legal document, um, that um, my name is um, City Councilwoman Johnson and that it reflects that on here rather than um, of the plain mentioning of city council member. And for clarification, where, where does that appear? Is that in the resolution or the cover letter or? The resolution. All right, I don't have that in front of me. I guess um, Madam Clerk or, or Mr. Cousy, is that an appropriate motion on something like this? Are you meaning on the now therefore be it resolved? Yes. Is it that section? Resolved by the City Council of City of Omaha. Page two. No, right here. Oh, it's <laughs> inserting Johnson after City Council Member Johnson representing the district. Um, it says here, Planning Director of the City Council Member representing the district. <laughs> That's where um, we, we do know who that city council member is. Um, since this is a legal document, then that should reflect city council member Johnson. That would because be 10 years from now, we will not know who that council member is or was. Okay. I think that's standard language, right? But, I, but I don't, I'm not opposed to what you're describing. That's a, that'd be a simple amendment. Um, and I think you just made the motion to approve with that amendment. Mm -hmm. okay. The planning director and council, city council member Johnson. So if that, if you want to make that your amendment, I just wanted to be clear for the record how it should actually read. Okay. Is that a? You that's fine. That's, that's your motion? That's my motion. We'll take an amendment and then to be approved as amended. Strike the and add Johnson after council member. Should we include Dave Fanslow then too? Is your light on? No, no. <laughs> well, actually, it looks like it is. Okay. I don't, I don't see. No? Okay. That's the suggested amendment. Um, I'll second. It's a, it would amend, amend this particular resolution. No further lights. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Now, as amended, correct? Yes. As, as amended, Ms. Johnson? Um, I do have to do what now? Uh, 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 motion to, to approve as amended. Uh, motion, I move that we motion, I move to uh, approve the Resolution as amended. Second. Roll call. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Rowe. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Item 79, an ordinance to acquire private property to construct the 48th and Center Street lift station access drive. Public hearing on number 79 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing's closed. Item 80, an ordinance vacating the north-south alley lying east of South 31st Street, south of 8th Street, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on number 80 is today. Uh, Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing's closed. Item 81, an ordinance to approve the view on 39th tax increment financing redevelopment agreement. Public hearing on number 81 is today. Proponents, please. Ms. Hadley. Good afternoon. Bridget Hadley, City Planning, here to answer questions that you may have. 
Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Donnie Johnson, 4928 North 52nd Street, the Johnson and Question Foundation, and North Omaha Concerned Citizen Foundation. Again, Councilman, City Council of Omaha, Greater City Council of Omaha, we would like for you folks to say, we can buy all the gold we possibly can, but we need land. So would you folks consider that in your next tax instrument for some folks in North Omaha, land? Does that make sense? Mr. Ferguson, you said, you always telling me it's still on uh, Yes, we need script. to do that. This is number 3981, which is 3902 Dodge Street. Yeah, yeah, but again, Dodge Street and that whole development down there, I have no problem with that. I told them before. Look, folks, you took the Ebola money and started touring it down. You didn't do any of what you were supposed to do, and you built parking lots. Now you're getting more money for some things. I'll tell you the best part, if you can figure this out, Mr. Ferguson, since you're a great city councilman. All that COVID we had and all that money we spent on that Dodge area, how many citizens went down there for medical treatment? They put 20, what? So this, this is not the med center. This well, is it's a, a part of that whole process, all that Settle Creek and all of it. This is all of it. I go down there nosing around all the time, and I found them spending Ebola money last time. Now they're spending money they're not supposed to this time. But ain't none of my business. I'm just looking for land for us in North Omaha. Okay. That makes sense? Thank you. Yeah. Any other opponents today? Larry Storr, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. I'm opposed to TIF in general. And in this area of 39th and Dodge, 3902, I've been by there a couple of times. I don't see why that needs to be developed other than to draw hope to build it so they will come, I guess is the word, uh, to support uh, the new bus. Uh, monster, that thing they call orbit, that nobody rides. But also, it's just right up the street from the Blackstone area. And not too far from there going north to the Salvation Army and Cummings Street. So we have another social services opportunity zone in this area, I guess. But it sounds to me like it's uh, part of the master plan that, that uh, provide the bus thing all the way to Fremont and Des Moines and build it and they will come. But I, I think you're going to find out with technology going the way it is that people aren't going to come. They're going to stay home and work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents today? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Ms. Hadley, I, I might just a comment for you. I, I didn't know if the applicant was going to be here today, but I'm fully supportive of this project and seeing the old travel land get redeveloped. But I will note that in the meantime, and sometimes these things do take time when you're going through this process of, of redevelopment agreements, but the site has not been well kept. Um, if you could pass it along to the developer that we expect them to keep that uh, mode and in shape in the meantime, that'd be um, appreciated. I will. The um, attorney who represents that developer is also here, so when okay. you do hear the message. All right, message received. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Jobin. <laughs> Next item. Item 82, an ordinance to approve a major amendment to a mixed-use district development agreement for Candlewood Hills, located at 708 North 124th Plaza. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on number 82 is today. Proponents, please. Hello, Katie Underwood um, Olson, representing the applicant, 2111 South 67th Street. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any other proponents today? See none. Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Item 83, an ordinance levying a special tax assessment for Weeds Group 2022-06. Public hearing on number 83 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Item 84, an ordinance levying a special tax assessment for Litter Group 2022-07. Public hearing on number 84 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. 
Item 85, an ordinance to approve a master customer agreement with Motorola Solutions, Inc. in a total amount of $1,214,182. Public hearing on number 85 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 86, an ordinance to accept the bid of Hyman Fire Equipment to provide 114 sets of personal protective equipment bunker gear for the Omaha Fire Department. Public hearing on number 86 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 87, in ordinance oh, to... Mr. Oh. Claremont, your light on? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to slow you down a little bit, <laughs> Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is a, a softball for me, talking about number 86. Uh, with the opening of the new Fire Station 31, uh, that myself, Council Member... Harding, Council Member Melton, obviously the mayor and the chief uh, split the hose apart at. Um, and when we talk about this PPE and we talk about this extra set of bunker gear or the bunker gear for the firefighters, uh, it takes me back to the station, which I really don't have words to describe. Um, I think everybody that is stationed there now will probably never ever retire until we make them. And, and part of that uh, tour and, and tar part of the facility uh, was what we seen with um, the extractors, which um, would wash this bunker gear for the firefighters. It's an entire full room with a shower. You can hose off and get all the contaminants off you. And then obviously the machines that are will be in this station to, to keep our firefighters safe. So um, I wanted to mention 31, but also uh, definitely in support of this uh, PPE for the firefighters. Thank you. Yes, thanks for mentioning that. This is an important item. I know we have firefighters with us today. This, I think, completes the funding of the second set of turnout gear we've been working towards for quite some time and is very important. So, so thanks for pointing that out. Mr. Hardy. Thank you. I, I too, was just going to mention the, the having the importance of, of the second set of fire, of the turnout gear for fire. And I know this is a project we started working on a couple of years ago, and I'm, I'm glad we're finally to this point. And, and uh, I, I want to thank uh, Vinny's son um, for, for being a model in, in the picture I posted for the splitting of the hoses at 31. <laughs> he liked his firefighter hat, that's for sure. All right, thank you. Next item. Item 87, an ordinance to approve an agreement with the Marsh and Associates, Inc. to provide advisory services for the City of Omaha's Investment Management Committee. Public hearing on number 87 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 88, an ordinance to approve an agreement between Heartland Workforce Solutions and Dynamic Workforce Solutions in the amount of $1,900,000 to benefit the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, Title I Youth. Public hearing on number 88 is today. Proponents, please. Hello, my name is Stan Odenthal. I'm with Heartland Workforce Solutions, 5752 uh, Ames Avenue. And uh, I'm a proponent for this. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be here to answer those. Great. As well as, well as uh, item number 89. Great. Thanks for staying with us. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Item 89, an ordinance to approve an agreement between Heartland Workforce Solutions and National Able Network in the amount of $1,934,070 for adult and dislocated worker services at the Greater Omaha Workforce Development Area One Stop Center. Public hearing on number 89 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is clo oh, closed. <laughs> number 90 is getting anxious there. They've been here all day. <laughs> Item 90, an ordinance to approve a coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds agreement with Front Porch Investments to administer City of Omaha Rescue Act program funds in the amount of $20 million. Public hearing on number 90 is today. First, we'll take the applicants, and this is an example of one of those items that is complex in nature and new, so we have asked the um, applicant, Front Porch, and Ms. Dillon to give a brief presentation on uh, this program of work, and then we'll take proponents and opponents. And we have some folks by Zoom on this one, too as proponents. So Is there a way to get back to the desktop here? Yes, we'll, we'll clear that screen. Oh, all right, okay. For your knowledge, we, we lost your Zoom members there, but I, I think 
okay. you're well aware of the impact development fund. I can speak to any questions that might come about um, that part of this. Ooh. Meredith Dillon, 1120 South 101st Street. I'm the Executive Director of Front Porch Investments. Uh, thanks so much for giving us a couple of minutes just to share about our organization briefly and a very brief presentation and happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Front Porch Investments was created uh, with this vision that our community, um, we're a community committed to ensuring ha all have a home where they can thrive with bold decisions and effective innovation that reflects housing as a human right. So part of our mission as an organization is to make sure uh, we're housing our community. And uh, Front Porch was created as a response from a study that you all are familiar with. We've had lots of discussions around it on the affordability in the Omaha and Council Bluffs area. And uh, five main goals came out of that study um, with strategies that were attached to th these goals. And many of them are reflected in the proposal today. So to accelerate the production of quality, dedicated affordable housing, preserve and improve the quality of existing affordable housing, prevent and address housing instability and homelessness, and foster innovations that reduce the cost of providing quality affordable housing, as well as providing relief and assistance to residents in neighborhoods experiencing gentrification. And those strategies that were uh, that came from these goals included setting up large-scale funds for the preservation and development of affordable housing. Our programs cover a wide variety of housing uh, need across our community, and the Development and Preservation Fund, which uh, this proposal is uh, attached with, um, is shown here in the in the presentation to really help you understand the the, the breadth of the types of housing opportunity that this fund can actually support. Front Porch Investments did an innovation round of funding this spring, and um, I wanted to share a couple of points from that uh, process that we learned, which was number one, that the need is high in our community. So in a two-week cycle, we received $49.6 million worth of requests um, through applications and awarded over $7 million uh, in both loans and grants during that cycle. Uh, some of the outcomes and impact from that cycle, we're seeing over, uh, cat catalyzing over 700 units of mixed income and affordable housing, uh, launching new pilot programs through nonprofits, supporting emerging developers. Um, so we specifically uh, supported three uh, black developers in North Omaha on their inaugural projects, which we were excited to be able to do, as well as uh, supporting partnership with uh, Canopy South and the city in an application for uh, HUD funding through Choice Neighborhoods, and then supporting or leveraging public-private partnership obviously um, is an important part of our work, and, and uh, you'll see that again through that Choice Neighborhoods application. So the Development and Preservation Fund broad goals are just as the name states, is to really provide gap financing and support for the development of new affordable housing, as well as providing support for the preservation of either naturally occurring affordable housing or um, housing that's in disrepair that if reinvested in with these types of dollars could also ensure that those units become dedicated and affordable. The strategy between the City of Omaha and Front Porch Investments includes $20 million ARPA uh, funding coming to Front Porch Investments and Front Porch Investments providing a $20 million philanthropic match to those funds. Um, there are several ways that the funds will be allocated and we've created a plan that allows us to maximize the use of ARPA by first funding uh, low interest loans uh, and then when those funds return push the funding out a second time in the form of grants. So it's a way to really be able to maximize the federal funding and produce as many units of housing as well as as much supportive programming as possible through the ARPA funding. Uh, some of the key elements, again, development of rental and for sale affordable housing units, preservation of existing affordable housing units, things like acquisition, site remediation, pre-development activities can be supported as well as home buyer supports and down payment assistance for individuals and families um, who are looking at home ownership or trying to maintain their home ownership. 
I also want to point out that this proposal was supported by 12 other nonprofit organizations. Many of them were here today, and unfortunately, the rearrangement in the schedule, um, we, we lost several of our partners, but I'm sure we can have them send emails of follow-up since they weren't all able to attend for the period of time, and we're grateful for those who are here to support us today. Our funding goals overall, again, to make um, new affordable housing units preserve as well as increase opportunities for home ownership for low to moderate income families. Uh, because our this process is an application driven process, we can't tell you the exact amount uh, that will be given to each activity, but I've listed out our estimates based on our prior funding rounds as well as um, the, the estimates of cost per each activity that we anticipate funding with both the ARPA uh, dollars as well as the private funding. So pre-development activities, again, development, preservation, and gap financing, uh, property property owner preservation and rehabilitation, as well as home buyer support, housing supportive programs, so connecting folks to uh, affordable housing, capacity building and operation uh, uh, for our uh, both nonprofits that serve, again, in, in connecting folks to programs, but as well as those that do affordable housing projects, and then the compliance and performance reserves, which is um, the, the funding that is actually set aside for the loans as a loan loss reserve. And if those are not drawn down upon, also go into the grant making portion of this agreement. So I wanted to just give you a really quick overview of the first round of funding, some of the parameters and what this will look like um, in order to distribute the funding. So. Up to $15 million in ARPA funding would first be distributed in low interest loans. Again, these are a 1% fixed interest rate, and the eligible loan types are pre-development, acquisition, construction, and bridge loans. The projects must fall within the boundaries of the city of Omaha. Uh, projects outside of qualified census tracts must provide proof of additional amenities and or services such as access to transit or employment opportunities. ARPA funding will support the creation of uh, rehabilitation excuse me, the creation or rehabilitation of units and or projects for individuals and households at under 120% of the area median income. And that mixed income projects can be funded at the percentage of affordability under 120% of the area median income. A few other details here in terms of just the, the period of affordability and minimums on those. Um, if, we, if you all have questions, I'm happy to get into the details. Um, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I do want to show you a couple of um, just quick slides on the funding process, which again includes an application process, uh, front porch and city staff review to filter the number of requests if necessary that are sent on, and this is the loan portion, to underwriting. All of our loan applications go uh, that are any decision will be made on go through a full underwriting process and we partner with a group called Impact Development Fund, who are partners who have been waiting on Zoom for us, um, and they can answer any questions if you have any on the underwriting process. And then Front Porch and City staff, uh, alongside of the review committee, um, make recommendations to our board for approval. The board uh, makes decisions on those recommendations, and we announce awards. So just a little bit of a timeline. Again, when we're looking at the first round of ARPA funding, our Current schedule uh, pending your approval of, of this agreement would uh, be opening our application cycle August 15th and closing it on September 13th. Again, the quick turnaround is to ensure that we can get those dollars out once in the form of loans that they can be returned and go out of, again in the form of grants. All of the first round award funding would be announced in November of 2022. And then in 2023 and 2024, the philanthropic match funding will be used to support both the loans and the grants. Um, we see that those the funding comes back in in late 2024, early 2025, and again pushed out a second time in the form of grants. All of this alongside of the private funding where um, all the activities that were listed will be in funding cycles and applications will be received throughout that period of time to um, give these awards for these different activities, all of which the goal is to increase, again, the affordable housing that we have across the community, as well as support and access for individuals and families to be able to get into affordable housing or home ownership. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
We'll take other proponents now on number 90. Hello. Uh, my name is Bree Full. My address is 603 North 36th Street, and I am speaking to you today on behalf of Spark. I'm excited to let you know that I am the new advocacy coordinator uh, with the purpose of advancing holistic community development efforts in East Omaha. I'm looking forward to working with each one of you to do just that by creating a better city where people and neighborhoods can grow and thrive. Today, I come to you to enthusiastically express Spark's support of the city's par proposed partnership with Front Por Porch Investments, ongoing efforts to provide funding for addressing Omaha's significant need for more affordable housing options. I'm not here to lecture you on the importance of the work that this project entails because I already know you understand the impending threat to Omaha's future if we do not fully invest in more affordable housing. The careful consideration that FPI and their stakeholders have taken into developing this proposal will ensure that its implementation process will produce the desired results of building a more robust and sustainable infrastructure for affordable housing development in Omaha. Spark's role in all of this is to play the part of supporting emerging developers with the education and financing needed to invest back into their respective neighborhoods. We know that this approach is important because it provides for a more sustainable and equitable way of development that centers the affected community and prepares them with a framework to keep building off of in the future, with no pun intended on that. The impact of this work will not only be felt in East Omaha, but ultimately will have a positive effect on all of Omaha. More than 1,000 households in Omaha will benefit from it, and the continuous nature of, the, of this approach insinuates even more benefits for the future. We urge you to consider the approval of this partnership, and if you have any questions about Spark's role, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other proponents? Hi, uh, my name is Alex O'Hanlon, 3902 Davenport Street. Today, I'm here on behalf of One Omaha. Uh, One Omaha empowers people where they live through education, training, and engagement. We support neighborhood-based We support neighborhood -based organizers working to build thriving neighborhoods. And we know that one of the most foundational aspects of a thriving neighborhood is access to quality, affordable housing. That's why we're here today to support the allocation of ARPA funds to front porch investments for the purpose of building new affordable units, rehabbing existing units, and also assisting with home ownership. This is a smart move on the part of the city and a wise use of ARPA funding. We're very excited for this funding and we think it's an important step into increasing the amount of affordable housing in Omaha. Thank you. Other proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Larry Store, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. Oh boy, oh boy. This was just like the circus side show, the carnivals I used to go to as a boy. And they had the barkers and the promotion and the fancy dancy things and the card tricks. Oh yeah, and in the movies, the old movies, there was the medicine man who drove into town in a wagon. Had the doctor or somebody's bitters that would fix everything. This kind of scares me. This was a good, a very good presentation. Absolutely beautiful. Very touchy with the front porch theme and the lonely little chair there in a peaceful backyard. But it scares the hell out of me. You know why? The word gentrification. I picked up on it right away. This is part of the CRT scam. Critical race theory a Marxist theory to pit people against each other. Here we're going to, oh, look, wait a minute, I forgot the wimpy burger. I'll give you $20 million tomorrow if you give me $20 million today. Yeah, there's some private money back there somewhere too that's promising to leverage this other $20 million. But they're also talking about ARPA. And everybody's going to maybe hopefully get the money from ARPA. Next year, the following year, there will be more ARPA. I, we don't know that. They might be completely broke any day. And here you're 
promising to make fair housing and affordable housing for absolutely everybody. I do commend you for including seniors here, support for seniors maybe even. But ladies and gentlemen, the, the Constitution of the United States does not allow for all this. It's not our republic. Yes, if you want to make it a socialist democratic republic, then we can have these kind of programs and feed and house absolutely everybody. But you know what? Not everybody wants it. Not everybody will agree with it or go along with it. And then you have a rotting democracy. Thank you. It's happening all over the country. Thank you. Any other opponents today? Donnie Johnson, 4928 North 52nd Street, the Johnson and Question Foundation, North Omaha Concerned Citizen Foundation. I think what these young folks are trying to approach is very similar to Habitat and that's other programs. And I, th I recommend they look into it much more deeply, but this is why we've been asking for all these type of programs to invite the United States Department of Agriculture as part of the programs. This would be better for us in North Omaha any taxpayers' money, any funding coming out of Washington, D.C. and the Douglas County, but that should be part of it. Because homelessness is getting worse and worse, and it's 10 times worse in California, and it's going to get worse and worse. But I believe as we talked to Ronco, and they looked at that 449 acres of land out by Washington County Highway 3536, and they agreed to come out there and move some of the refugees and some of the baby boomers out there, would be a lot better of spending taxpayers' money because they'll be working versus having the state or the federal government subsidize their income. This is why we're saying, let's, I, let, I like their programs. I've listened to it on TV when they was talking to the mayor. But these type of programs are not working in the long run. So maybe we should, if they can invite the United States Department of Agriculture to work with them to move some of the baby boomers and share the wealth in that direction so that we, as the baby boomers, don't have to rob Paul to pay Peter because this is not going to work. It hasn't been working. Homeless is getting worse and worse every day. And it's going to continue because uh, continue, there are no jobs. Where is the job going to come from? That's what Marty Seager kept saying. We need to replace the meat packing plants. And they haven't done that. They do everything else other than replace them jobs. Mr. Ferguson, I think you're a wonderful councilman, and I thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Are there any other opponents today? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Meredith, I might just ask you a couple of questions and then we'll see if there's sure. any our lights on from council members. So first I wanna say um, thank you for working on this issue. I think it's really important and it's a complex issue. And I think you have a very well thought out strategy here that you've worked on for quite some time. Thank you. Um, and I think, although your partners couldn't stick around today because it's gone late, um, you do have an impressive number of partners. In fact, this is the first time I've seen all housing interests all on the same page, all working together, which I think is <coughs> critically important to the outcome of this proposal too. And it's not just nonprofit partners, although there's lots of them. This also applies to for-profit developers, right? Absolutely. And individuals. Yes. Uh, uh, individual homeowners. I think that's an important thing to point out too. Um, so Front, point, front Porch is brand new. Um, can you just uh, briefly tell folks um, who is Front Porch, who is your board of directors, and then also who is making decision, who is the committee making decisions on these applications should they, should this move forward? Sure. So again, to your point, um, that although Front Porch is somewhat new, this has been a plan that um, has started back with the uh, assessment of affordable housing for the Omaha and Council Bluffs Metro. So. This um, is, a, is a well thought out uh, strategy and plan. It's been underway for over two years. And um, Front Porch was again created as a nonprofit to actually move forward on the strategies that were identified in that study so that we didn't just point out a problem and we actually brought solutions to the table. Um, we were uh, created and, and launched last August. And our board of directors includes um, in, 
investors into our organization, uh, including philanthropic, as well as philanthropic partners and other folks with development experience. So, um, our, do you want me to list out the entire board and the committee? Yeah, I think it's or, a pretty small number, okay. if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I just hope I don't miss anybody. <laughs> I should have brought that with me. Um, it's Susie Buffett. I also have Carrie Sanchez. Uh, we have Donna uh, Cush from the Omaha Community Foundation, Gail Grave, um, Todd Heastand, uh, Keith Station from the City of Omaha, as well as Colette Logier um, as board members. And then in terms of our review committee, uh, Greg Pechek from the city is uh, the new affordable housing manager from the planning department that will be representing the city on, on, it, on the committee as well as Keith Station from the mayor's office. And then we have Colette Logier, we have Aaron Bach, uh, we have Todd Heaston, and um, then the front porch uh, staff. So it's myself as executive director. We have Naomi Hadaway, Eva Roberts, and Tess Hazard. Thank you. <laughs> it's pretty good off the top of your head. <laughs> so I think <laughs> sure it's, I, the reason I asked you that question is I think it's important for folks to know because sure. this is $60 million and it's a partnership. Absolutely. And I think um, you know, it's important for people for transparency reasons to know who is front porch and why are they here and then who's the decision making committee Absolutely. and to know that there are city partners on that committee and also community partners on that committee mm -hmm. right a rotating community representative yes thank you for reminding me so um in terms of the the awards review committee we have a a, a rotating community member who works in the area of community development and in this next cycle angel sparks angel starks from spark <laughs> will actually be the representative and has um, a deep background in real estate Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then just briefly, the, the, the folks that were on, were on Zoom from the Impact Development Fund, mm -hmm. it's, they are underwriters, but they are also in, um, part of this partnership because they're helping to track what is a pretty complex financial formula, right? And the reporting parts of this and the loan aspects and the reloan aspects and all that, how that's all gonna be tallied up and how that's gonna work well, right? Correct. Impact Development Fund has been around for over 40 years. They're a, a CDFI, Community Development Finance Institution. They are located in Colorado, um, but we partner with them and they do all of the loan underwriting as well as then the, the uh, servicing of the loan, the monitoring, and the reporting. So they have an organizational system that is created to do, to do that. And they have, uh, again, the depth of experience that we hadn't found anywhere else um, in the country to be able to provide the types of, of loans that we'd like to provide over the, the broad array of loans, as well as looking at individual applications for underwriting on an individual by individual basis and not um, in, in sort of a typical way where you say where risk might be assessed by only the history of an organization. It's being able to look a little bit more deeply about the organization's financials, um, their their mission and their vision, and and not always. I think a lot of times uh, we we think it's a brand new developer that automatically makes someone really risky. And Front Porch actually wants to be able to support new and emerging developers, like folks that come out of the Developers Academy from Spark and others who want to participate in helping to build their community. Mm -hmm. So it was really important to us um, in the way that they. Uh, have a history of, of kind of working more holistically in their processes to include them as partners. To perhaps make loans where others might not make them, right? Which is yep, part of the we're point. willing to take a risk sometimes where a traditional financial institution might not be able to. And again, that's the reason for having the loan loss reserve as well, so that um, we can take risks on small and emerging developers. And, and we already talked about that earlier today in, in council, but it's really important that we're supporting uh, new faces in our development community. I agree with that. And from our perspective, the, the city's ARPA funds, if this is approved, are appropriated and spent. So when you're then dealing with a reloan process, you know, two or three years down the line, that is um, something this, those folks help track for you. But from a city perspective, those funds have been appropriated, right? Absolutely. So once the loans come back in, because again, for the for the ARPA funding specifically, we'll only uh, use that for the short-term loans. So 24 months in length is the longest term for the ARPA-related ARPA funding. That's why it's important to bring the public and private together because it allows us to, to offer the full spectrum of loan products, but keeping each uh, funding source separate. And so making certain that the ARPA funding is limited to the 24 months 
when that funding comes back in, it'll be pushed out a second time in the form of grants, again, to things like construction projects or any type of programming that could be completed within a year so that we still have all of the phases of projects, all of the programming, everything is completed by that December 31st, 2026 guideline. Great. Really is a, is a great partnership because, again, of being able to, to maximize the funding use by using it twice, kind of a creative way to approach that. Yes. So only two more questions for you. Sure. Um, what, what does success look like in your mind um, <laughs> with this $60 million allocation? Well, it's, it's 40, so <laughs> we'll keep it to 40. Sure. Try to add we 20 hope, we hope extra sure. 20 million that I don't have yet. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, the, what I would say was this with, with the 40 million, again, we want to maximize the number of units created or the number of um, folks that we get into home ownership, yes. But beyond just the number of households served, we really, again, believe it's important what types of projects are getting supported, who's who's a part of that, who's building the projects, who's benefiting from those projects. And so if we are successful, what I see is that we have been good stewards of an investment and, and partnership between both the private funding and the public funding. And we've shown that in working together, we can um, create more and more, more innovative approaches to housing our community, but also that more um, a more diverse group of folks are a part of that development and in the wealth creation that comes from developing housing. I, w I would also say that success would include that more families have access to housing. And in just increasing the number of units we are able to produce every year, we're lowering the cost of housing for everyone. That's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And is there a, a number of units associated with your goals too? So we have estimates that, again, are associated with um, you know, each of these categories, I will say, you know, the initial estimate that we, that we gave was no less than 1,000 households that would be served. I will tell you with the $7.3 million worth of funding that Front Porch was able to allocate in our first round, we saw over more than 770 units of, of housing could be created. So I think that the 1,000 um, unit goal is a very it's a low bar to be honest with you and so i hesitate to associate a number because i i believe that we will serve many many more households yeah i, I see this as a major step forward but when we, we talked about this in planning committee this morning a little bit too that um the need is so great it can be a little daunting but you got to start somewhere and that, also, that that comment also applies to the city's affordable housing strategy that's underway today that we all had briefings on and i i know you're involved in that too in many respects you're much further along <laughs> than that study is at this point. But what I hope does come out of that study is similar findings to what you're describing, but also some policy recommendations too that we can all pursue. Absolutely, uh, we'd love to see um, policy that supports the work that we all need, know needs to be done. I think all of us agree, I've had many conversations with all of you, that there's a need for more affordable housing. There are a lot of approaches. If there was one and one way to fix it, we would have already done it. Um, and so it's gonna take all of us working together and that policy piece will come back and support those efforts and that vision for all of us. So absolutely, looking forward to that. Great, thanks for your work on this. Now for the lights, next item. Item 91, an ordinance to approve the expenditure of coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds for premium pay in the amount up to $3,000 for each city employee is amendment of the whole request by the law department. Public hearing on number 91 is today. Proponents, please. Mr. Indemash. Thank you, Bernard Indemash, Deputy City Attorney, and I'm, I'll just make a presentation and then happy to answer any questions. Uh, as, as most of you know, uh, ARPA provides that funds can be used, the ARPA funds could be used to provide pay to essential workers that supported the community through the public health emergency that we obviously were arguably still in the midst of. And that definition talks about employees that helped maintain the continuity of operations of critical city functions and infrastructure. And that's, I, I wanted to point that out because that, uh, that continuity of operations language makes it clear that it's something more than just necessarily public safety people, which is obviously the first people that would come to mind. In this particular regard, the city was approached by its three largest unions, uh, the Omaha Police Officers Association, the Omaha Professional Firefighters Local 385 and the Civilian Employees Local 251, uh, who all made requests to the mayor to receive premium pay from a portion of the city's ARPA funds. Uh, and after consideration of those requests, 
the mayor's office uh, made a decision that they would go ahead with that recommendation. Now, one of the initial things, and I know we discussed it this morning, uh, has to do with, obviously, we're a couple years into um, the, the, the case and the potential of being able to award compensation for work done in the past. And the prohibition, unfortunately, that we, we face appears in Article 3, uh, Section 19 of the Nebraska Constitution, which provides that you can't provide extra compensation for services that were rendered previously. Uh, and that ends up being an impediment. And, and I appreciate there are some people, even though most of the employees that are employed now were employed then, there has been some turnover. And um, this particular process doesn't necessarily recognize people who have been in the past. And, and that's that's the reality, but that's a result of the constitutional prohibition uh, that, that's, that's in there. So the decision was made to award $3,000 per employee. Uh, there were two different mecha mechanisms that that could have been used. You know, you could consider a lump sum payment or ultimately what was decided here was to provide a $10 premium per hour uh, for employees who work um, and the requirement to be at work as opposed to working remotely is a requirement uh, that appears in the regulations that are pr promulgated by the Department of the Treasury. And the decision to move in that manner was in part administrative, much easier for us to do the, all the extensive reporting that's required by the Department of the Treasury. And secondly, some of the impediments caused by our payroll system and the programming that needs to occur to, to make this occur. Now, one of the things that was addressed was um, we needed to enter into memorandums, understandings with the various bargaining group. You have attached to the original ordinance seven memorandums, understandings that address all, this, all seven bargaining groups that the city is obligated to negotiate with. The ink, you will see by reviewing those that this particular uh, payment is non pensionable, so these earnings will not. Not only does the employee not pay pension contributions, the city won't pay pension contributions, but more importantly, it won't impact an employee's pension and won't have a negative impact potentially on the pension system by providing a benefit that, that wasn't fully funded historically. Um, the Assuming that you approve this next week, and obviously that's assumption, uh, this period, this would go in effect for pay period starting July 24th of 2022 two through November 12th of 2022. That's eight pay periods. There's potential for 640 hours for somebody to work in that pay period. The reason we chose such a large period is to account. There's going to be some people that are on vacation. There may be people that are unable to work. Some of that was in discussions with um, the leadership of the Omaha Professional Firefighters Association, where they were worried with too small a time period, there wouldn't be a sufficient number of time to make sure that, that each of their members received the full benefit. So that, that's the time period that's there. There's roughly 2,750 full-time employees that will receive the benefit, of, presuming, of course, that the, the council approves this particular expenditure of ARPA funds. The amendment of the whole that's before you um, was uh, expands those who are eligible to receive it to part-time and seasonal employees, part-time and seasonal employees who work during the applicable time period would be entitled would be capped at uh, $1,500 again at $10 per hour. Uh, there are currently I, I asked HR today for the number there are currently 750 part time employees and just under 250 seasonal employees. So that adds another 1000 employees that would potentially be affected uh, by the by the premium pay. So that that's how it works. Uh, we feel comfortable based on the guidance from the Treasury, the feedback that we've received from Deloitte Tushu's our hired contractor, uh, that this is permissible under the ARPA guidelines. Uh, we, we negotiated with each of the uh, bargaining groups. Um, certainly, some, would, some wanted more, but for the most part, I think the bargaining groups were appreciative uh, that the mayor and, and hopefully the city council will recognize the efforts that they made uh, during the, the time um, and some of the inconveniences that obviously affected people and continue to affect people, quite frankly. So anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Other proponents today? Mr. Toey. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Trevor Towie. I'm the president of Omaha Professional Firefighters, 6005 Grover Street. 
Um, I'm here to voice my appreciation of this resolution and ultimately ask for your support. Uh, it's easy to tell by sitting in this room today that you're often tasked with the role of appropriating money for assets important to Omaha. Um, you've approved money for land, buildings, libraries today, special projects, safety equipment. Um, you approved some money for fire trucks recently, so I appreciate that very much. But uh, this resolution, I feel, is an opportunity to invest in what I feel is the most important asset that Omaha has, and that's its workers. Um, dur during the pandemic, the term essential worker was used quite often. And as an advocate for workers, I appreciate uh, the recognition for them. And I appreciate all the work that was done in the city of Omaha to keep it functioning uh, as a taxpayer of Omaha. Uh, but I felt I should take this opportunity to talk about the work that the firefighters and paramedics, my members, uh, your employees did during that pandemic. Uh, because as we all know, during that pandemic, my members didn't have the opportunity to work remotely. And there was no opportunity for them to be socially distant. Uh, there wasn't a shutdown. We worked and came to work every single day. We responded to every single 911 request that there was in the city of Omaha. And during that time, those members continued to provide life-saving interventions to thousands of Omaha's sickest COVID patients. And that's why I think this resolution is important. Um, I don't see it as a gift. I don't see it as a um, reward. Um, I see it as it's, it's a benefit that's been earned multiple times over uh, by the members that I represent and by all the essential employees. This is certainly uh, the definition, uh, the work that my members provide is the definition of an essential employee. And so I appreciate your support, uh, your consideration on this resolution. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for your service. Any other proponents today? I will note that we have a letter of support from Local 251 that came today too for the public record. Any opponents today? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Mr. Bagley, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. I, I talk a lot about the dignity of workers and this item number 91 here for compensation um, is Mr. Towie did a great job of articulating what his members did for our community, the Omaha Police, Public Works, civilians. Um, when we're, a lot of us were, were not in the fire, so to speak, with dealing with COVID patients and Back a couple years ago when that started, it was an unknown kind of thing. The whole world was kind of turned upside down, but our employees of the city of Omaha, the Omaha Firefighters Police, local 251 members, and even the part-timers, they stepped up and filled that void when it was needed the most. So I'm glad to um, offer my support for this coming up next week, but I appreciate the comments Mr. Towie made today. and. Uh, Council President Fester then mentioned the letter from Local 251 that we don't forget the dignity of the, the work that people did in, in the city of Omaha. And uh, I appreciate that some, I wish it was more, but I, I think it's a fair recognition of the workers that got us through those trying times during COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I want to thank the mayor for her work on this because uh, as we heard, it's, it's different employees through the city had different jobs to fulfill and they all did their jobs, including our staff, our city clerks, uh, everybody that shows up to the city and does, does their job makes the city stay open and keeps their lights on. So um, she had a very difficult decision because uh, public safety is a big part of our budget. Uh, we know the work that uh, took place between the police and the firefighters, uh, being on the public safety committee. Uh, we know the changes the firefighters had to go through with donning equipment, sending one person in uh, for the safety of all members. Of course, when you go back, you're still around other people. 
but it's really hard to ever determine who did more or you know with this money that's there so ultimately uh, the mayor made the decision that every single city employee, regardless of what bargaining unit they were a part of, uh, would receive this. Um, and, and I thank her for that because that's a tough decision to make. If it came before me, honestly, uh, I wouldn't have picked one bargaining group. I would have only been in favor with the way it's presented in front of us for everybody in the city. That is the absolute fairest way to do it. Um, I do have a little heartburn that those um, who are not with the city now uh, aren't a part of this. Uh, they kept our city open and operating as well, but that's the way it is and that's how we move forward. Um, there's also some parts of this too where uh, we have city employees who actually receiving this money will, will not be a benefit to them. And I haven't heard the part of uh, opting out because believe it or not, there are people that work for the city that once they make a certain amount of income, they lose the benefits they need to survive, whether it's health insurance or the housing they have. Um, so Bernard's coming back up. I'd love to hear that opt out part because I missed that earlier. Yeah, and that issue really didn't necessarily come up until we got to the point where we were talking about having part timers come back uh, and the potential uh, to meet or exceed certain earning um, levels that might affect their Medicare or other insurance. And so um, the discussion with, with payroll and, and human resources is obviously there shouldn't be any problem with people opting out. So we've tried to set, we've set up a process where people can, and we'll try to make sure that's communicated in the communications to people that they have that ability, that merely they need to inform the human resources and the payroll department that they, that they do not want to participate. Uh, and, and they do in that instance, they will not be obligated to participate in this process. We certainly don't want to, in, in an effort to um, acknowledge the work that people did, put people have a negative effect on, on any on any person at all. That's that's obviously counter to what what this is intended to to do from the very outset. Okay, I appreciate you saying that. That means a lot, especially uh, to those folks that work for the city. That uh, it's not a benefit to them. Um, and the other part of it too is this is a, a blessing in disguise. The way I see it, uh, for the HR department, if you can't attract and lure employees for the openings we have within the city of Omaha from the dates of July to November <coughs> with ultimately $10 more per hour for the open spots we have, I don't know that you're ever gonna get anybody. I mean, let's think about it. These spots that we have, especially the entry level jobs, after July 24th, they will come with $10 more per hour I'm gonna be scratching my head come November if these spots aren't almost 100% filled, not that they ever can be 100%, but if they're not, what more could we possibly do as a city? And, that, and that's a side note, but that's the way I look at this as well. I mean, for a, a new employee starting out where they see that wage that they may begin at, and all of a sudden it's, oh, hey, by the way, you're gonna get $10 more per hour, up to $3,000, of course. Um, that's a, a huge benefit. Uh, to, to help with the, the shortage we have across the board uh, in all departments um, that we need help in. So again, I wanna thank the mayor. I wanna thank the bargaining groups who came together uh, with uh, being part of this and uh, Mr. Endenbosch as well for uh, seeing this through. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Melton, you're recognized. Yes, for anyone who's still watching, I just wanna remind everyone that even with the addition of the part-timers, all elected officials are excluded from this. Neither the mayor nor any of us sitting here will be receiving any additional money. Just a reminder so that when we vote, I want to make sure there's no self-serving votes here. Thank you. I was going to mention that too. I think that, that, worth that, is, ac that is accurate. <laughs> and I also appreciate the, the point uh, Councilmember Palermo just made. Um, while it's a discouraging conversation to have with someone that they can't receive this, this premium pay, due to Medicaid cliff effects, we do wanna make sure we have a process so no one is putting a bad position around it and it sounds like we do. So I look forward to supporting the amendment of the whole um, next week too. No further lights, Thank next you. item. Item 92, an ordinance to approve a real estate purchase and sale agreement with Civic Corner LLC for a redevelopment site located northeast of 19th and Capitol Streets for approximately $1,524,600. Public hearing on number 92 is today. Proponents, please. Good evening. 
J. Klein, representing White Lotus Group, 2036 North 48th Avenue. I'm here to answer any questions, but I'm happy to give a short narrative overview of the project if that would be helpful to the council members. Sure, how about a short one? <laughs> I know, it's we're, we're at the very end. So um, the Civic Auditorium site, as you know, is a nine acre parcel of land located on 19th and Capitol. And the site includes a parking structure with 454 parking stalls uh, that the city will retain. The project area for Civic Corner outlined in the purchase and sale agreement is roughly seven acres, including rights of way. And our vision is a mixed use, largely multifamily, mixed income development that aims to create a friendly and inclusive lifestyle environment catered to a younger urban population that wants to live and work in the city. Some of the outline details are 250 to 300 market rate apartments, 100 to 140 affordable units, and the average AMI is about 60% retail and office on the main level, and 20 to 25 townhouses for sale. The remaining acre of land is being reserved for future potential civic or commercial use. Um, I'd also like to note that due to the more recent announcements regarding the significant reinvestments in the urban core, um, mostly the streetcar, we are looking into potentially increasing the scale of our plans in order to make an even larger impact to the site. We've been in discussions with multiple development partners, some of them national, and we anticipate working alongside with them as we redevelop the site. One such partner is Front Porch Investments, so it's pretty timely that we got to hear from Meredith earlier. And based on this project concept that we outlined, the applied, uh, we applied for and were awarded funding through their innovation round. This funding will help ensure more highly amenitized affordable housing on the site. This is not only very exciting news for us, but it also validates the need and our approach towards providing more affordable housing in the urban core. If you have any other questions about the project, I'll be around to answer them. Thank you. Other proponents, Mr. Anderson. Troy Anderson, uh, Mayor's Office, 1819 Farnham Street, here to answer any questions. Thank you. Other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Donnie Johnson, 4928 North 52nd Street, Omaha, Nebraska. The Johnson in Question Foundation, North Omaha Concerned Citizen Foundation. I think what these young men are trying to do, when my son was attending Creighton University playing basketball for Dana Altman, I studied that corner. I like to claim that corner for eminent domain because Walmart wants to put some things there. So we've been trying our best to negotiate that corner, and these young men are doing a good job. But then, as I look at this whole process, I was wanting to share this with the city council because I was watching Wagon Train last night. And this guy, he, he had a wagon, but he didn't have no horse. So the wagon train was going to take off. Is that the same as get putting a cart before the horse? Because we need a Walmart downtown. We've been trying to get that done. But if these young men have the money, if they don't have the money, or if they're going to be subsidizing the money with taxpayers' money, I suggest we claim it at eminent domain and put a Walmart super center there, which I've been no, excuse me, negotiating with Walmart, and they said the land is too high for them at this point, but we can claim it in a different direction. So in the meantime, does that make sense to put the cart before the horse, or should we just continue building houses, no jobs, and they're going to lose the property anyway because they can't pay for it? So what should we do, get the job first or the house first? That's been all. In fact, one of the development out west, I asked them, why don't y'all put the streets in first and then the house? It's a big argument, big debate. But should we put more houses or should we look for jobs? Or does that make sense? Put the heart, how does that go? You're supposed to be a highly intelligent Mr. Ferguson and a scholar. You should figure this out for us. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Any other opponents today? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Yes, um, this question is for uh, Mr. Jay. Oh, pardon? For Jay, for me? Jay, yeah. yeah. Hey, Jay, um, you know, uh, you probably kind of have some idea where my questions are going <laughs> to come from, and um, they're going to speak and piggyback on what Mr. Johnson has said mm -hmm. over and over again mm -hmm. um, regarding jobs, jobs, jobs. How will we 
ensure jobs are going to be in great demand and and, and that the construction work is going to be completed by those in Omaha and uh, the uh, underserved community is going to have a opportunity to gain that work. Or do we have any strategies in place to do that? Well, um, we're a little bit early before we get to uh, the construction part of this particular project, but. Uh, based off of our past experience, when we have gone through the construction stage of a project, uh, we put that project out to bid just like everything else. Um, when we hire a contractor, it's their responsibility to ensure that all subcontractors that um, they hire, that uh, they had gone through a process where they advertised it in a way that was uh, reasonably uh, accessible to uh, all uh, subcontractors and so I would expect that they would adhere to uh, um, to those requirements all right and then finally how will we not outprice uh, individuals out of the area um, due to the fact that maybe their income is fifteen thousand dollars annually are, are we uh, referring to the affordable housing that we're proposing uh -huh. Well, um, you know, our, our goal is to meet an average of 60% AMI. And so that means that we anticipate some of the individuals that would be potentially living in the affordable units uh, could be less than that, and some could be more. But our target is 60%. And so as far as, you know, whether or not we're being able to create housing for individuals that are, you know, $15,000 a year, um, you know, that's, a, that's, that's a, a question that I can't answer right now. Would you entertain that discussion at a later time, or would you consider that in your uh, process as you develop this area? I'm, I mean, help me out here, because my community is concerned about all of this new development coming along. and. And, 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 and there were redlining, gentrification, sure. and all these kinds of things come, come up over and over again. I would, enter I would entertain any discussion regarding that. Mr. Anderson? Sorry, those were really good questions, and I thought I'd maybe chime in. <laughs> uh, just differentiating between kind of what the developer is bringing to the table and ultimately, perhaps, what the city is trying to accomplish with the the land that is currently under the ownership of the city. Um, so, number one, you you had talked about jobs, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, wanted to maybe provide a little bit of color here, right? Um, we've been trying to chase jobs in the downtown urban core for the better part of two decades, right? And it didn't work. In fact. We have actually been um, very attentive. Um, we've been involved in a number of national searches to draw and attract very large employers to our urban core. And you know what we heard was, you have a lot of really exciting things going on downtown and, and you've got a lot of really, but you don't have the people. You don't have a workforce downtown that we can employ. So over the last couple of years, we've sort of done a 180 degree turn, right? And we've said, okay, we hear you, right? Let's get people and talent downtown and the jobs will come is what we've been told from employers. So in response to the questions around like the Walmarts and stuff like that, um, you know, we've, we've been talking to grocers. I've, I've been talking to grocers for, <laughs> better part of two decades, right? And part of the response that they come back is you, do, you don't have you don't have the foot traffic, you don't have the, the vehicular traffic, you don't have the demographics. And so that, that's where we've switched, right? So it's, well, while we know and understand there's a need for jobs, 
we need the people first, right? So that's why you've seen a real concentrated effort over the last couple of years. And there's been a number of really successful projects that we can point to about adding density and adding residential opportunity. To, okay, so then you asked about the, the question around how do we, well, the, you heard it from the front porch folks just a few minutes ago, right? It, it's, a, it's somewhat of a really easy macroeconomic. The more supply you create, the demand goes down and the lower cost for housing comes down. So we are feverishly trying to bring as much residential density, as many residential options. You hear about all the efforts around missing middle housing that we're trying to bring to not only the urban core, but to the city as a whole. So I, I think that's kind of where the developer comes in. We have city owned land, right? and the, the city owned land has sat vacant for years. Um, in fact, the previous development pursuit somewhat floundered in because there was uh, a job, an employer that didn't materialize, right? These folks do a great job with housing and we are really excited about the opportunity that these folks bring to the table to help us bring a much needed asset. You heard from folks which are people to our urban core and to our city. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Harding, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, I was just gonna say that that's a, this is a very good discussion, very important discussion to be having, but um, um, as it relates to this agenda item, not relevant. I mean, we're talking about a real estate purchase. Um, what, what, the, what the developer does with it and how it happens is a later discussion. Very important to have, but I just wanted to make sure we kept it on subject here. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Mr. Anderson, you only got a few, a few short meetings left, so I'm trying to think of <laughs> questions for you here. Um, and, and maybe Mr. Fanslaw could weigh in as well. So as far as you can remember about this uh, corner of property that we have in front of us today for uh, a sale agreement, which I'm really happy White Lotus is uh, going to invest in this because I feel they're invested in the community to, to make this a, a, another great project. I mean, everything we have in front of us is a great project <laughs> right now. I don't know how else to say it. But how many times have you uh, been a part of this lot almost being sold to somebody? Uh, so this is the second sort of formal, I mean, we've gotten folks that have approached us and you know, maybe want to buy the property and sit on it. And I mean, but th this is the second. Um, and and as I kind of mentioned, this was sort of a, a 180 approach to maybe the original. So this is my second go round in four and a half years. So it's a great project. It might be even mm -hmm. worth you sticking around for. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And I, I would just add that we had a conversation earlier, Shirley, about. But this is a land purchase, that's what this item is, uh, yes. and there'll be much more to come later uh, in terms of details about what you're intending to do, but I appreciated the update because there has been lots of starts and stops on this one, and so, and it's a very important property downtown. Um, and so my, my two questions, or maybe three qu short questions, were um, about the purchase price, which is fair value, not market value, right? But I Correct. think that is consistent with community development law because they are pursuing the affordable housing aspect of this, which I appreciate and we had a long conversation about earlier today, that'd be the reason why the mayor's office has no get negotiated the fair market price versus um, the actual, or fair value, fair value, value price versus the actual market price, right? That's correct, yeah. Um, under the community development law, you know, there's a, a community need, which we have spent a, a fair amount of time around affordable housing. Yes, there is a community need associated with the transaction, this real estate transaction, and because of that, we can look at the fair market value uh, versus perhaps the appraised or market value. And, and that can also be enforced, right? I mean, I think Jay talked about 130 or 40 maybe affordable housing units, but that's that'll be part of the agreement, right? To, have, to get this purchase price? Yep. And in terms of the timeline, there is a clawback provision in here. Should that not work out for whatever reason, you know, given some of the history here with a previous developer, that for whatever, if for whatever reason it doesn't work out, um, the city can buy this property back uh, at that same price. I think the date is um, 
if things aren't moving forward uh, by the end of 2022 and, and they aren't closing or are actually working on construction by the next year or two, right? That's correct, yep. Yeah. So that's your general timeline then, right, Jay, um, to actually have construction? Yes. Obviously? Yep. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Well, I just wanted to say, since I'm a logical person and I look at facts and I make my decisions based upon the end being in mind. So those questions that I asked, very important for me to make a decision. Thank you. Thank you. No further lights. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for sticking with us. Thank you. We do have a motion needed by uh, Council Member Bagley before we close here. At the public hearing on item number 116 for August the 2nd. There's a motion and a second, and the reason for that is to, um, to align that with public hearings on that item on different items that are coming on the agenda. Motion and a second, roll call. Johnson? Yes. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Rowe? Yes. Bagley? Aye. Harding? Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. To second, roll call. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Rowe, Bagley, Aye. Harding, Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Meeting is adjourned at 540.